Welcome to the lab, everybody. I'm your host, Joshua Diaz, and we have a fantastic show for you this evening. Very honored to have uh, two great guests with us. First off, we're, we got me, your host, Joshua Diaz. Thank you so much for being here. And as always, uh, show your appreciation for a friend of mine, great guy, great detective, great person. Uh, he's been in law enforcement pushing 30 years and uh, has worked over 300 homicides. You know him as well as I do, Mr. Chris McDonough. Thank you of the Cold Case Foundation and the interview room. How are you, Chris? Outstanding, Josh. Hey, Lab Rats. What's up? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And um, our next guest, a very special guest, and uh, I just find him and his insight fascinating. Uh, and I'm very thankful that he came on the show with with us tonight is uh, Dr. Gary Bricado, and he's a clinical psych, uh, psychologist and researcher, also an author. Uh, he is um, in the areas of a psychotic illness, as well as severe violence, including serial mass and spree murder. His book, The New Evil, you can get on Amazon right now. And uh, it is a it is a read. There it is, right there, Doctor Gary. Thank you for being here. Of course, I appreciate. It. Thank you so much. And so, um, well, you guys, we we did it. We're here, and uh, uh, I like I said, I appreciate both of you uh, coming on here. And um, it's just good to have uh, very qualified guests. I'm not used to that. <laughs> Not too many podcasts are. That's a fact. That's a fact, Dr. Gary. That's a, that is an absolute fact. Mo most of them, most of them, you know, we're 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 scraping the bottom of the barrel. Right now, we're getting the cream from the top. Okay, so I can't complain about that. And uh, anyway, so how are both of you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. How about you, Gary? I'm doing well. I. I uh... I'm here. I'm alive. I'm grateful. Yep. You're you're a busy man, and I like I said, I appreciate your guys' time. And so tonight, um, something that I've wanted to do with Chris and Dr. Ricotta for quite some time is uh, we were we were going to explore the Summer Wells case a little bit more. Uh, we had a show, I believe it was in November or something around that time. The three of us, uh, and I. I Thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, listening and, and discussing the case with you guys. And Chris and I have have talked about this case uh, quite a bit. And, and we were, I've always been kind of fascinated by the the uh, psychology of it. And that's obviously where you come in, Dr. Gary. Uh, we're going to take a look at, I, I believe we when we discussed this, it was three different options. Or not options, but scenarios. Uh that we kind of pinpoint what is the most likely scenario and what is the least likely scenario. And, you know, we, we have stranger abduction, trafficking and, and, and murder or accident cover up. I, I believe, I, I don't know. Would you lump those into each other doctor or, or how would you do? That? I suppose that the three umbrellas are, you know, domestic situation, whether it was accidental with a cover up or intentional uh, and, you know, a, a stranger abduction uh, or home invasion situation. Uh, and, um, you know, the third possibility being that the child is alive and, and being trafficked. Uh, so I think that pretty much covers where most people's opinions on this case fall. Uh, and um, I think it's a great idea to kind of walk through each one and see if anybody could possibly walk away with any 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 one of those interpretations other than one by the time we've kind of gone through it logically and and 
Chris, you, you and I, when we have talked about this case, we've gone back and forth on, on different theories, on different thoughts. Uh, one of the things that I tend to come back to every time is that the parents know more than what they're saying. And I think that that is a fair argument. I don't think that that criticism is over the top. I don't think that, um, I don't, I don't think that it's negative to say that it just feels like what we're being sold. Isn't, uh, the true story. And, and I felt that way from the beginning. Uh, would you, would you say that's a fair assessment? I think that's a very fair assessment. And I think the authorities also agree with you, um, because they've made it, you know, clear into the public arena that there is, uh, those, everybody's still on the table. They've not taken anybody off the table. Yeah. And, and I've always just felt that there was something missing in a chunk of time that, that has been missing. And the whole thing, you know, is just, uh, you know, from, from interviewing Don, from him calling into the show and it, you know, it has gotten contentious at times, no doubt about it. And never, do I walk away from those kind of conversations feeling great about it? But, you know, personally, when, when you're being told something and it's just, it just seems to me improbable, almost impossible. Uh, that's where, that's where it kind of gets into, uh, you know, you kind of get frustrated with who, whoever you're talking with, uh, which is never the case, but the I want to, what I want to do is I want to play an interview for you, Dr. Gary and Chris. And Chris, you've seen this before, and uh, it's the first interview of I believe it's Dawn in the street. Uh, this is right after Summer goes missing. He's in the street with his son, uh, talking about this case, and uh, I will play it for you right now and then i want to get your uh, reaction to right it. after by do you mean the same day do you mean no i would say month? i would say close to a week uh so about a week and they had been they had been being interrogated by the police the police were on the hill uh for quite some time they had blocked off a lot of roads and i mean they were, there was a very extensive search going on with a lot of agencies at the time and it just, you know, they, they were, they were being questioned. They were give, given polygraphs and everything with the polygraphs and so other, everything's nothing is it's set in stone. Nothing is uh, final. You know, they say they passed them, but then there's some people that say, you know, well, they didn't. And then Candace has even said, well, there's been some dispute about them, you know, and you hear that guy kind of a lot as well, although they're not admissible in court, obviously. So it's kind of a, kind of a point that's right. not m worth arguing much. I mean, that's just, but, but, but I think it is important before we even proceed to emphasize that our goal here is to be completely agnostic about what happened here, because these are people who are innocent and proven guilty, who haven't even been charged. Uh, so that it's important to make clear to the audience that this is just about trying to deduce what is the most likely thing that may have happened here. But it's important that we not come across as casting aspersions without somebody being charged or without uh, without it being clear that people are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. I think you'd both agree. It's important that agree. we put that out there. I would agree. Or any speculatory conversation is had here. Absolutely. Well said, doctor. And, and it is true. They have been charged with nothing uh, when it comes to the disappearance of their, their daughter, Summer Wells, uh, their children had been, have been, their other three children have been removed from the home. Uh, if you were listening to the detective, he says that the, both of those cases bleed into each other that there is some sort of correlation, but we don't know what that correlation is of the children being removed close to three weeks or a month after summer goes missing. Um, I have speculated, and this is just speculation that maybe the investigation had progressed. They found something, you know, just, I, I don't know. I don't know why, why the children were taken. I just know 
that according to the detective, that the two cases do bleed into each other somehow, some way. Now, this right here is about a week after uh, Summer goes missing. Dawn gives an in the road interview. And it's just a short little clip, and then um, we'll go from there. So when her mother come in, she says, where's Summer? She went down in the basement, but she didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. This morning, Donald Wells spoke on camera for the first time since his daughter disappeared. Please let Summer be okay. He says it's unlikely Summer would leave the house on her own. Wells says the last time anyone in the family saw Summer was when she entered the house to play in the basement after gardening with her mother and grandmother. Wells also spoke about his gut feeling about Summer's whereabouts. Some bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea. Wells says law enforcement have covered leads on area sex offenders and drug addicts. We're trying to think, beat her brains out. We're covered everything that we can think of already. Investigators say they have followed up on 85 tips so far. Wells says he is overwhelmed by the massive numbers of personnel on site. We just really appreciate everybody trying to help. They have law enforcement and all, all these volunteers that are here. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. That was John Janko reporting those sentiments shared by Hawkins County Sheriff Ronnie Lawson, who said he has never seen a show of public support like this in his four decades of law enforcement. Yeah, today the TBI and Sheriff Lawson said Summer's family does continue to um, uh, cooperate in this ongoing search for the little girl. They say that at all points the family has uh, continued to be uh, assisting in this process. So that's early on in the in the case, and that actually does. The narrative of that does change eventually by the sheriff that I will show you later on down the road. Uh, but really, that's the first point of contact with with Don and uh, his oldest son in the middle of the road, which I found when it happened. I, I was very I was very kind of turned off by the whole, you know, how he's presenting, uh, you know, he's got his arm around the child and just putting the kid on camera in general just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, but he's, he's saying that basically she went down to the basement. Summer went down to the basement. The mother went to check. Uh, she wasn't down there. She went out the back door, which was unlocked and that some bad person has her. And that's really the Who went out the back door though. Well, she, he, it sounds like he said that Candace did because okay. it was unlocked. But as you find out later on that they talk about how that back door is never unlocked. And that back door is a very, very hot topic of, of this case. Okay. Because first of all, I don't know many little kids that want to go play in a dungy basement by themselves, especially a little girl at five years old. Um, but uh, did, did, what are your thoughts on just that initial little minute clip there, uh, doctor? Well, first of all, it's impossible to to read somebody's mind, but I can tell you as a human being, the impression that I had um, was that there was something very flat and stilted and scripted about that presentation. It, unless somebody is having a very traumatic reaction where they're very flattened by an emotional experience, it's not really consistent with what I'd expect to see with somebody who thinks that a bad man has taken their child away into the darkness. Um, you know, we don't see tears. We don't see, you know, fighting to hold back tears. We don't see, it's more like a mechanical rehearsed quality. Uh, and um, I don't know if you both also had that impression, but it doesn't feel, the affect isn't authentic. Um, I'm sure that both of you know, when you talk to a person who is having a very strong, authentic feeling, it stirs feeling in you. You, you you can feel the, the tears about to come into your own eyes or the upset of the individual. Listening to this, you don't have in your gut a feeling of um, authenticity, although it's impossible to say. Um, but um, the other thing is that, that I, I thought was very strange was leaping to the conclusion that a bad man 
um, took the child. Uh, you would think that that one would entertain a whole bunch of other theories before leaping to something as specific as that. Didn't even say a bad person or a, <laughs> or maybe she wandered off. It's like a bad man took her. You know, it's like okay. I mean, but it but it it, it has the quality that you see sometimes in people that are not very bright or creative and are trying to come up with a cover narrative for a what i've called elimination murder where somebody has either accidentally or intentionally been sort of like eliminated because they're an impediment in some way or you're treating them a certain way and they die by accident is what i mean and um and then you have to cook up a story and because you're not you know a master of doing it you come up with a ridiculous narrative remember that um that's an empathy issue right i mean what you were talking about were you someone tells you a story and you're thinking how do you believe that i believe this that's an empathy problem right because it means that you can't feel that the other person could feel that you're ridiculous that the story is ridiculous right so um i'm reminded for example um years ago someone you know doesn't matter who it was but a, a person that i knew in life um showed up one day to school with a bunch of white in their hair because they had dyed it obviously and the teacher said what happened to your hair and they said well i was trying out for the olympic swim team and i got a little bit of chlorine in my hair today and it left this white patch you know whatever. and even as a little kid i thought that is the biggest load of crap i've ever heard in my entire life you did that to your hair on purpose <laughs> and i think it's, it's like there are people like that that can't feel that you could listen to them and know the story is ridiculous. And so I think that says something about a person's intellect and creativity and empathy. And so that is one way to see it. Another way to see it, of course, is that this is a person who authentically lost a child who's been abducted, who is flattened and, and kind of in a state of dissociated grief. And I think we have to say that in fairness because it's impossible to say. Um, but I have to tell you that my gut inclines me toward the first impression uh did both of you have a similar sense that it felt kind of stilted and not real you Chris, go first josh oh, you sure, go I'll, first. Go first. Hey, I'll go first uh yeah i i felt that it was uh kind of emotionless i'm not you know i'm no expert of any kind but like you said i i am a human and i have covered other cases before and it is it is about it, it is about as uh flat of a response and with no real public plea, please bring my daughter back. We'll do anything. Um, you know, just kind of the basic human aspect, parent aspect where you're just pleading and crying for your children. Now, look, Don may not be the pleading and crying type, but I think that when your daughter goes missing, I, I, that anybody would become the pleading and crying type that that's just how i would feel about it i didn't uh, i didn't buy that uh like initially when i heard about this story and her and her going missing and she uh, you know they were claiming abduction right away i i obviously i believed them when i first heard the story i was like wow this is this is unbelievable this is you know so sad that somebody would take advantage of this poor family you know, because there was a sob, not a, I wouldn't say a sob story, but he would say, you know, people have been coming up here, stealing stuff off our property. And, you know, for a long time, there's a lot of bad people on our road. And I was like, wow, like this is really sad. And then, and then I saw this interview and I went, Hmm, that was kind of weird. And then the interview that, uh, the sermon on the Mount or what I call, what I think is a eulogy is, um, when I, when the worm started to turn for me and I just went, you know, none of this is making any sense. A stranger abduction on a, on a hill, like a dead end hill in the middle of almost nowhere, uh, just seems unlikely. I told you the statistic, uh, 470,000 kids go missing a year. Most of them are found out of those 470,000, 4,700 are stranger abductions. That's 1%. And then they go into the statistics of location. They go into uh, opportunity. We're talking about a dead end hill in the middle of in the middle of uh, 
well, I'd say the middle Eastern Tennessee, not a lot of neighbors close by. I mean, there are people there. So I never really bought the, the stranger abduction theory. I think the reason that they went with that personally is because it kind of absolves them of all responsibility. No neglect, no personal involvement. We don't know what happened. Somebody came and took her. We were doing everything we were supposed to. Well, Josh, just so that I understand, and I have some familiarity, but it would be good to kind of review it with everybody is talk a little bit about the troubled past that he himself, the father himself had, uh, particularly with regard to children and any yeah, kind so, of offenses. So Don has been accused uh, by more than three, four different, I don't know how many, Chris, do you remember how many exactly? It was a seven. Okay. So, and, and only, only, how did, what, what was that? AI. <laughs> Where'd the balloons come from? Watch it. I, I don't know how that happened, but I just, oh, this is all I did. And all of a sudden you got a celebration going on here. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so I believe it was seven total, uh, two of them being I his such a weird, such a bizarre moment that I, I didn't know if I was waiting for like Rod Serling or Alan Funt to come out and say like, you know, you're on the, you're on the, camera. Well, you're on the, 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 the programs the now have artificial right. intelligence built into them. That Look at crazy. that. I, I just did that. And I just had a sorry. thumb had popped up. I'm sorry. I, I just it's crazy. I, Go ahead, Josh. We didn't mean to throw you off your uh, your game here. Go ahead, buddy. We all yes. I don't have a game. <laughs> I've never it's seen nuts. balloons like that. It's nuts. Um, that was funny. So he has been accused and uh, even admitted to uh, abusing his stepsisters when when they were younger. Specifically, one one in in particular. Uh, he's had uh, a troubled life of domestic violence, drugs. Uh, he has stolen women's panties from their homes. Uh, he's been accused of trying to sell his child uh, years ago. He categorically denies it, but he denies almost everything thrown out there. But I think it's important for us to say that he does deny s that happening, but he doesn't deny well, he, I wouldn't say he doesn't deny it, but he kind of plays down his involvement with his stepsister when she was five, he's 12, and it goes on until, I believe, 19, and she was 12? Yep, it ended when she was 12. And he, he was, was 19. 19? Yep. And uh, because she called him out and got the family involved. Yeah. And so when you get an explanation from him, you know, he said, well, she's, she was the one that instigated it. She's the one that started it, which to me is a backwards way of, of thinking, but you know, I, I don't, I can't really try to justify anything that he said about that. I, I even said to him one time, imagine standing in front of a judge and explaining that one, your honor, she was five. I was 12. She's the one that instigated it. I, I don't know. You know, most, I would think, majority of judges would go that i mean that's just absolutely insane to even present it that way but that's the way that he did kind of justify his actions nobody's perfect we were kids blah 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 you know that's the what have you done in your life uh, you know kind of your so then you as he kind of progresses in age he, he meets candace who has also had her run-ins with law had her children taken, uh, her first set of children taken. Um, there's some dispute about what kind of abuse was going on, but uh, they, her children were taken. Candace has lost seven children total. Dawn lost two to the state. Uh, excuse me, six. And Summer, who was missing, and then Dawn lost his two children uh, back somewhere in the late eighties, early nineties. Uh, and they both lost custody of all their children and they were living, uh, with four, four more children. They ended up having four children together and now all the children are gone. Some are missing, but, uh, Don and Candace have a lengthy history 
of uh, criminal activity, uh, uh, violence, drug use. And I mean, there's no, there's really no two ways about it. That's just not, you can't really dispute that. Well, there's two points that are behind the question that I posed. One is that I'm a statistics based person. When I think about a crime, my Chris knows that I keep extensive records and databases and things. I, for example, with mass murder, Chris knows I was one of the co-creators of the Columbia mass murder database, right? It's the largest in the world. I mean, it's, I'm consulted, you know, all the time about questions related to that. So I'm the type of person that if you were to present a crime to me, I'm thinking in a kind of mathematical way saying, well, what is the probability of it being a male? What is the probability of it being in this neighborhood? What's the probability of it being someone this age? What's the, and so you wind up with a a kind of a likelihood. And what bothers me about this is, is that this is a person who has a history of what are essentially sexualized offenses, according to what you're saying. What is the probability of a person with a history like that, having his own child targeted by another person with a history like that in the same little zip code where chances are based on the number of people in the zip code, you'd have a very tiny number of sex offenders. I mean, what you're basically saying is is that it would be like completely against probability unless of course they were people that ran in similar circles and one sex offender knew where the other one hung out and expressed certain interests or things like that. It would be very, very against probabilities. That's the first thing that bothers me. The second thing is, is I, I, you know, this is one of these cases that makes me think of the famous play, The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde, which has a line in it that is apropos to this, which is that um, (laughs) uh, Lady Bracknell is talking to a man, Mr. Worthing, who wants to marry her daughter. And she asks about his parents and he says that his parents are dead. And she says, to lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, might be seen as unfortunate, but to lose two begins to look like carelessness. <laughs> right. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's something, it's like you, <laughs> when you've lost that many children, uh, after a little while, it starts to look like maybe you have something to do with it. And so I, I think I have that in the back of my mind again as a as something that there's an improbability there because what are you saying that in this one case it was a total outside situation but in the previous situations it had something to do with what was going on inside the home so you have to start thinking in that kind of statistical way about how incredibly improbable we're getting here and occam's razor would tell us a far simpler approach would be if you only need one sex offender and you have one living in the house isn't it more likely that that's the person who has something to do with it? So I just think, you know, you want to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, you can't cast dispersions, you know, and, and charge people, you know, in the court of public opinion and stuff. But I just think it's something that should be sort of in the back of your head from a statistics point of view. And then, of course, from a profiling perspective, and Chris, I'm sure you would agree, there are a lot of problems with that story in terms of like, the danger of the 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 high risk quality of the person doing it the fact that the dogs don't seem to bark the facts the the fact that you you know you as i understood it there was like a couch blocking that door which is then mysteriously gone (laughs) you know the door is supposedly open is that where's the couch the fact that the 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 child was supposed to be in some kind of idyllic situation planting you know with grandma or something whatever that story was but in fact, they were living in a kind of dungeon that looks, you know, looks like a kind of a medieval torture device, you know, to be in that room. There are a lot of problems with the story. And I think they just, they would bother an intelligent human being who was looking at the story. Uh, and, um, you know, so so I just kind of want to put that out there. <laughs> that, sure. that I think from a profiling perspective, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, Chris, wouldn't you say, I mean... Everything about it. Yeah. Every every comment you made is right on target. And I think taking into consideration now the other piece of this, right, from an investigative analysis perspective, if we just looked at the, vic- the victim risk continuum in this whole thing, right, everything points to a very low risk victim 
i.e. high risk in relationship to environmental factors, i.e. you know abuse or that kind of problem. Mm-hmm. However, abduction, if we if we put, you know, we categorize an abduction and we look at the environment situation, circumstance, low, medium, high, everything falls on that day in the low risk category. And that tells us, and this is where the card team from the FBI came in, and I can assure you, they use the exact same analysis that Dr. Gary was just talking about myself here, Josh. And they came away with, okay, one of two possibilities, maybe three. Number one, this was not a stranger abduction. A, it's too high risk for an offender to know the exact moment that child was going to be in that basement that day, and then somehow get that child out of that mountain without the child screaming, without neighbors hearing. I mean, you you have all of these variables that are risk to the suspect. So even a sex uh, a high risk RSO will not take that chance. So that leads then. What are the other probabilities? The other probabilities are that whoever came up onto that property, if it was somebody that took her, had, uh, sorry, that's my carpenter. He's working on my, the back of the uh, the living room here. He's, anyway, I apologize. It's, it's uh, actually, it's Buddy. We all know. It is Buddy. No, it's a, it's a buddy of mine. He's working back there. Uh, thank anyway. You, thank you for the balloons, Chris. I, I know I got to hit, wait a minute. I'll do this, do this again. Yeah. See if it works. There it is. Right oh, there. Wow. How come it, it's not? You got to put your set, put your fingers up like that with a five and see if that works. Okay. Well, anyway, so we, we now, we're now left with the idea that says, okay, if it's not a stranger abduction, then what is it? Then it's either a, an accident or B, she walked out that, you know, somehow she disappeared out that door. Well, then you take into what considerations and, Dr. Gary can talk about this at length, the victimology in relationship to a five-year-old. How does a five-year-old think? Hey, a five-year-old, and remember, she's only five, even though she's been missing you know, three years now. She's only five. Hey, she has not progressed since that day. Hey, we, we have in our mind that she's six, seven, and eight, but she's only five at that time for her mental capacity. So that then of itself says, Okay, what are the probabilities of a total stranger, okay, coming to that house, knowing there's going to be a five-year-old in the basement that just got home from the store, okay, was dropped off not more than 15, 20 minutes before that, okay, and that she, that moment, was going to be in that basement. And he could come right through that door, a, a one-way window, by the way, right, because it's a reflective window, and know for a fact she was going to be there. Just know for a fact with mom, dad, the or, or excuse me, mom, grandma, the other two children. Why didn't he take the other two children? You know, why why just her? Why limit it if you're going to take that high risk? And, and so, three, three children. Yeah, exactly. Why didn't why don't you just take one of the boys too, the youngest boy? Take them right. both. And now and now you have a double whammy, okay, in their minds. They're sick, they're sick thinking. So the Odds of that happening were just out the window. And so the car team left and said, this is not a stranger abduction. Now, the sheriff's department has to say to the public, all things are still on the table. They have to. It's a public relations situation. Okay. If by that, you know, 0.5%, it turns out to be some craziness. But more, more importantly, the bottom line here before all the balloons and everything popped up <laughs> was it's a high probability that if somebody did take her, they knew the sur- surroundings. They knew the family. Somebody had access point to that child. They had an access point. Now that doesn't mean she could have been handed off. That doesn't mean, you know, the type of situation where, you know, it couldn't have been a friend that said, hey, come on over, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But it's somebody familiar with the Wells family and with the Wells property. I'll guarantee it in the uh, ultimately uh, when this thing kind of plays out. 
Yeah. You know, and Chris, that I kind of, when we've discussed this before and I've said that ultimately, uh, that I, I believe that it would lead back to, like you just said, Don and Candace. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were the ones that, that did whatever happened, but introducing your children to very unsavory people is the same thing as just putting them in direct harm's way. And you might as well be the perpetrator uh, yourself. And I just, I believe that the reason that the children are removed and have been removed is because that they were in direct danger of what I I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but you would think that that would carry some sort of criminal charges as I well. Want, I want to show something. He's got more balloons here. I don't know what's going on with that. I love it when, you know, folks on YouTube, everything they know about police work came off of the internet. <laughs> okay. And this is, this is a manual. See what it says? Child abduction protocol. Okay. This manual has been out for years and years and years. You don't get this manual in the public. Okay. I have taught this manual. <laughs> For years, okay, statistically, the, when, you know, you see all we do is talk about speculation on blah, blah, blah. Yes, that is, that's kind of a half point, okay? But the full point here is the statistics have shown what we're talking about is accurate, okay? It's, it's not a guess, it's accurate type of information. And this is what the investigators are responding to. This type of manual. This is what they're, this is how when Summer went missing, somebody at the department broke this thing out and said, holy cow, what do we do? And there are three sections, four sections in here on what to do. Okay. So, that takes all of the speculation out. And look at the first page. See through the eyes of the child. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that an interesting principle that law enforcement, so the first thing they did was they went into that basement and they thought, what is Summer seeing? And once you understand that, now you can see through the eyes of the hunter, the perpetrator, and that's where Dr. Gary comes in. And you pick up the phone and you say, Dr. Gary, you know, hey, Doc, here's what we got. And, and we could play that, we could role play this thing for a second. If I was there and I was in that basement, I'd pick up the phone and I'd say, Hey, Gary, here's what we got five year old, mom home, grandma home. Two other brothers home in the basement. I'm standing in the basement. You got to see this place. Okay. There's a question of whether or not the door is locked or open. It's up on top of a mountain in a holler here in Middle Tennessee. Okay. Um, maybe a couple of sec RSOs around the neighborhood. Okay. But the victim continuum is putting her at a very low risk, the very bottom. Thoughts on a perpetrator. Boom. Right. Gary, what say you? Well, first of all, um, there'd be a very big difference between an offender that groomed and knew a person uh, and somebody that needs to just sort of snatch a kid that they're they're interested in, right? So one of the first things you think about is, is that the kind of offender who would groom a child would insinuate himself and in a kind of slick calculating reptilian way get close to the child pose as a friend gain the confidence of the child and then take them off um where you have a situation where somebody just snatches that's usually a very socially inept weird person uh who um wouldn't have social skills to do that and you would probably see some kind of a 
sign of a struggle or the kid kicking and screaming and being confused because somebody is literally, you know, opening a car door and grabbing them or walking up to the door and grabbing them. And, um, of course, that kind of a person would be more disorganized and easy to catch because they're usually local. They're usually somebody who hasn't planned very well, right? So what we have here is a situation where we're supposed to believe that somebody in a scheming way perpetrated this sort of perfect thing, leaving no DNA, leaving no hair, you know, no hair, no, you know, footprints, no nothing. The dogs don't even bark. You know, perfect little thing comes in stealthily and takes a child. And yet they're the kind of offender who, according to profiling, would be disorganized and kind of weird and and uh, and, and probably not very slick um, and good at executive functioning and planning. And so already there's a mismatch where you start thinking to yourself, isn't that interesting? You know, you're you're, you're taking an oddball. Uh, and turning them into some kind of mastermind genius. And you almost wonder if that's a kind of projection of the person making up the story, um, who isn't a particularly bright individual, perhaps, and might be a little weird, and who fancies himself something of a of a mastermind. Uh, but 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 I think that's just something to think about. But but I guess what I'm saying is is that there's a strange mismatch between those two things, wouldn't you say, Chris? That they don't jive. Absolutely. organized and disorganized at the same time unless we're dealing with a mixed kind of situation but i just don't see any sign of that also it's very high risk for somebody that's supposed to be so slick and whatever it's you know you're the the, the it's it, in other words like what exit is there for example other than to just come right back down the driveway right and uh, yeah and through the woods and and now everybody just heard what dr Bricado just said and he would have said that to the investigators right. at the scene. And so now they go away going, okay, what do we have then? What's left? Okay, what's where's mom? Where's dad? Right. Who, who's got access to the property? Why do they have access to the property? Who are the RSOs in the neighborhood? Right. And what have the children got to say? Uh, what are the dynamics in relationship to the interior of the house? Could there have been an action? Could she have fallen down the stairs? You know, yada, yada, yada. And you just go down this whole list. And that's why the investigation and, you know, they, the sheriff has come out numerous times that everybody's still on the table. Okay? They've not taken anybody off the table. And I don't think they are. They will at this point. So uh, did that help, Josh, to, you know, to kind of give you and, and other people a perspective of, how these things really happen they're not just you know they just don't show up right. and and start guessing through this stuff there is a science behind this and that and science fun. has been shown to be successful go ahead it's, it's very and i appreciate you yes that that helps a lot uh, it's important to realize too that as somebody that's been covering this case from you know the onset there are new people that are have become interested in the case the more eyes, the better. So sometimes you got to hit that way back machine and start sort of from the beginning. And I think the beginning is where it all lies. You know, the, the things that are going on now are kind of side shows. And, you know, it, we're two and a half years down the road uh, as their confidence builds that, you know, hey, maybe an arrest isn't coming. You kind of see more. Uh, be odd behavior, but the, the, the behavior in the beginning was absolutely, you know, bananas from, uh, people that were just getting involved from uh, the parents. Uh, uh, and it was just complete chaos. Uh, not that it still isn't, it's just not at a fever pitch like it was. Uh, and, and so I want to play this for you guys. And this is 13 days after summer goes missing uh, after her parents say that she has been abducted by a stranger uh dawn has given we saw dawn's first interview in the middle of the road and you know how we felt about that this one is where you get the sermon on the mount or the eulogy uh dawn be dawn is very religious uh at this point according to people in his life that he had never been religious before like it was this was kind of a new 
bound type of religion. And um, so I, my question, how do you want to, do you want me to play it through and, and, or do you want me to stop it when there's something to be discussed? How do, how do you want that to go? I, I'm open. I've seen this a dozen, dozen times. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, what, what do you think, uh, Dr. Gary? I'm always fascinated. I mean, you know, we can't make bricks without clay. We need some data. All right. So the more data, the better. Let's listen. <laughs> I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. Okay, stop. Me and my mother. For me. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she she just gave her a geographical profiling pinpoint or what we would call a contact site off this property off her swing or near her swing now this is a mom who has said she was in the basement and now she's saying the child's outside near the swing go ahead play that back and listen to it again i feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her has lured her away from here me and my, my mother and her were planting flowers. It's behind. You got to go back, yeah. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. Bingo. I know she didn't walk away off this, you know, off this yard by her swing. Why, why, why is she saying that? Right from the get-go, she's telling us there are two contact points here. One, the basement, which is her whole story after planting flowers. She went in the basement. And now, contact point number two, off this yard by her swing. What does that mean? Go ahead. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. Me and my mother and her were planting flowers. And we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And the amount of detail already in this, I, I always found a little odd. I'm not saying that none of that happened, uh, but she, you know, it doesn't really strike me as the detail from other things that I've heard. She's and high as a kite too. Look at her, look at her pupils. Look like a couple of pins. Okay. Yes. and that's 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 opioids they constrict the pupil but but it's yeah. it's not just the detail it's a detail that is giving the impression of a very rosy you know the the kind of mary poppins childhood when you take that information and put it against the backdrop of a child in a dungeon and it doesn't make any sense i mean you're talking about like you know planting flowers with grandma and grandma gives her candy and she can't wait to see the brother. I mean, you know, like it's one big giant terrific bake sale in the house, you know, <laughs> when in reality it's like a torture chamber. So I, I you know, there, there's something about that. And just, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, like, what are you trying to sell me? Like, this is a ridiculous story, mm, but, you know, but, you, but you see what I mean? It feels like somebody trying to come across like, you know, mommy dearest or something. We're 34 seconds in. Buckle up. Oh, Lord. Okay? And I walked it all the way over to the porch. And I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching. And we went in after we got done washing our hands. And she got a piece of candy from Grandma. And she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And I said, okay. And I walked her all the way over to the porch. And I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch summer. I'll be back. Now, get, now, Dr. Gary, it's important to note that from the camper to the front door is probably less than 15 feet. So what she's saying is that she walked. 
they were planting flowers and that she says, well, I want to go inside and do, you know, go see my brothers when her brothers were essentially upstairs, as they say, playing video games. But then she ends up in the basement, you know, from her story. But she's saying, you know, basically putting herself as kind of a helicopter parent. You know, I walked her over. I made sure. And I'm not saying that that didn't happen, but I'm not saying that it did either. And I said, okay. And I walked her all the way over to the porch. And I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer. I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. And I asked the boys where their sister was. And they said, she went downstairs, mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. Two minutes. She she sent her down there. She walked back over to the trailer for two minutes. And then she's like, you know what? I should probably check on Summer two minutes later. Which, in interviews later on, kind of gets stretched out into five, ten right. minutes, you know. But here's something else that bothers me. If you're casing a place, you're watching somebody, and you're going to abduct them. You have to study their habits and know when they're going to be isolated and where. Well, the child didn't go down there in a planned way. She went down there spontaneously. In other words, it would make more sense to snatch a person when they're doing their routine thing. That's the whole point. You make sure that it's a routine thing being done in an isolated place so that you know they're going to be there and you could snatch them. This is a situation where what are we supposed to believe? The person sitting down there waiting in the basement like an ambush for the kid to go downstairs and play. It's a ridiculous story. Wouldn't you say, Chris, it, it doesn't add up. The kid yeah. spontaneously goes downstairs alone, and that's when the offender, the, 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 it happens to be there. It wouldn't work that way. There would be yeah. something to lure the child to that place, or it would be something where you knew they were going to be alone every day at a certain time in that place. Yeah, no, exactly, Gary. And, and not only that, she's got to walk her to the house. Okay, there's this high vigilance of I got to protect this child to the house. Okay, from from the trailer to the house, there's this, okay, I got to walk her to the house. You keep an eye on your sister. Okay? And then it's like, hey, where's your sister? Oh, she's down in the basement, Mom. Okay. Okay. She's down in the basement. Okay. Okay. Now, just before that, there was this vigil high vigilance to get her from the trailer to the house. Okay. And now that she's in the house... It's yeah, go wherever you want. You you want to go down in the basement as a five year old? You want to go do that? Okay, no problem, not not an issue. But there's something about this, you know, that I've been trying to figure out for, you know, since I was in that basement. There's something about that particular statement that she is just. I think she's projecting. And it's obviously scripted. I mean, what do you, what do you say, Gary? I mean, don't you think that's a? It sounds it like it's poor. It yeah. feels scripted. Yeah, and you know, I have to tell you from experience of homes where there are cover up stories, you know, for for things either accidental or intentional, or you've eliminated someone because they knew too much or some other thing. Usually, what happens is there's one person in the family who is the more dominant. Uh, you know, more psychopathic or narcissistic or something. And even though, you know, <laughs> some, the, the partner may not be that innocent. He's sitting to the left. They're partly motivated sometimes by saving their own skin. You know, so there's a little bit of like the dominant one sort of saying, unless you want me to beat you up or expose you or whatever, this is the story and you better stick to it. And um, what happens is that the person starts to sound very rote in walking through the details and it feels as if they won't deviate from it, you know, and they kind of, and they stick to it and um, it doesn't feel organic and natural, but you, that's the sense you get listening to this is that it sounds like somebody has walked through the laundry list of like everything they want to say. And you almost wonder if someone gave it to them. And um, so that the, because it doesn't, it sounds so unspontaneous, you know, uh, non spontaneous, excuse me. So I don't know if that's your sense also, but this sounds to me, I mean, just an opinion, sounds like a memorized list. 
Yeah, you knew this was going to happen, Josh. So we apologize right from the get go. That well, the we, the, we can't go two yeah. seconds without analyzing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the microcosm of our of our. You got to see us when we're not on a podcast. I can't even go to a diner, you know, without <laughs> analyzing everybody in the joint. You know, forget about dates. No, this is fine. This is this is what you guys are here for, and I and like I appreciate you guys being here. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times. And I didn't get no answer, which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight. So, like Chris said, there, you know, the the hyper vigilant uh, mother walking her over, and now she's yelling to the basement down in the basement. Uh, and then you know she always answers me, or she usually answers me, but she didn't. So then she decides to go down there it's like check you know you know checkpoint one checkpoint two checkpoint three uh putting to me it feels like she's putting some distance between her responsibility of her ch uh, of her child uh and the disappearance meaning you know i told the boys you know stay with her because and keep an eye on her she was just gone I don't go on walks around here or and I didn't get no answer, which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. I don't go on walks around here or runs because I'm scared of the bears and snakes and even the coyotes that are around here. Well, whoever has my daughter, I now she interjects her own personal fears into the into the disappearance of this little girl. Thoughts, Gary? It's interesting. I mean, if she's aware of some of the horrendous things in her husband's history that you've described, he would be a hell of a lot scarier to have around the house than a bear. <laughs> I mean, you would think that you'd be protecting the children from that, right? I mean, lions and tigers and perverts. Oh my! I mean, you've got a pervert in the house. Wouldn't you be more frightened of that? Well, so that's strange to me. I mean, wouldn't you say? I mean, you know, it's yeah, you know, this mom of protectiveness will get them away from somebody who has a history like that. It's odd to me. Well, about eight months before this, uh, Dr. Gary, Candace had filed a police report on Don. And essentially what the police report says was that, you know, he's he screams and yells, throws things. Uh, and that he's abusive towards her, the kids, and that she's scared that he might hurt the children or could hurt the children. That's what, and this is a this is a signed statement by her about eight months before. And, and when you when you look at it, eventually the charges were. I, I believe she dropped the charges eventually, which again is kind of common with Don's domestic violence history. Even from his first marriage, um, the attacks are the same. The the meaning, like the type of violence, the grabbing by the throat and putting pushing up against the wall, that kind of stuff. And um, so, yeah, he, he you you would think that he's uh, much more of a threat than a bear or a mountain lion or you know something like that they have not harmed her but also what's important to note is that on the 911 call the dispatch who is relaying to the sheriff says uh please be advised that the mother went on a walk she came back and the child was missing about 10 minutes then she goes on here to say well i don't even go on walks and then, so I asked Don about that. I said, Don, why does it say, why, why did somebody say she was on a walk? And he said, well, that was a misunderstanding. A lot of misunderstandings. And they bring her back to us safe and sound. And just turn, I mean, go to the FBI, the police and uh, clear it up. Uh, enter Don Wells. And so, you know, he's, he's been looming, you know, just like in the first just like in the first interview with his son, yeah, he's right there. He's kind of got a a whole a handle on the situation. That's kind of how I feel about it. That he's sort of, you know, right there. Once again, I, I'll reiterate this. This is 13 days after Summer was allegedly, according to them, abducted. 13 days. And 
I don't know. It seems kind of elusive. It's really strange that I've never seen this truck, and I've never heard of it until just recently. But I wish they would come forward and explain themselves. And if you're not a suspect, they at least come forward and say what you've seen. She was a tomboy. I shaved my head. She wanted to have her head shaved like me and the boys did. She tried to shave her head. She tried in to the shave back her head and, herself. and make it. Uh, I think you can see it in some of the pictures, and it was getting out of control. So she. One of the one of the questions that people wanted to know was why she had a bald head. Um, her head was shaved. I don't know if there's any significance to this or not, but her he her head was shaved with no guard on a razor, you know, basically skinned and um, just taken all the way down. And so people were wondering, well, why, why was she bald? You know, why was she this or that? And there was a lot of speculation about that. And some say, you know, lice, some say, that she, you know, Don and Candace, their, their explanation right here is that she wanted to do what her, Mother and brother. Want to have her head shaved well, like well, me and the boys. Uh, Josh, you remember we talked to Mary, I think the name was, to Chris and I did on the interview room, and she said that it was because of lice. That the child's head was shaved. Um, I think... I, she, told, she told us that, that it was because of lice. Now, I don't know. You know, Take that as you will, but yeah. well, that was the explanation given in that. I interview. think that's what she... That, I think she said that that's what she he had done with his other children as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that that's... But he does. But they don't say that here, which is yeah. And I think it's important to point out to remember, this is the media asking you, why is your why is your kid's head shaved? So some producer is whispering, maybe in the in the ear of this reporter, find out why their head is shaved. Okay, so there's a. There's there's something going on even in the media's mind at this point. But but doesn't it tell you if look again innocent or proven guilty situation? But if this is a cover story, doesn't that give away the game? Doesn't that give away what you're trying to hide? What you're trying to hide is the idea that you don't take good care of children. That's the point. So you cover it up with this Mary Poppins story, but the you know, so, oh, you know, she wanted to be just like mommy and dad and brother, blah, blah. but the, but it turns out it's just because the kids have lice. Well, that's that tells you something, right? And that matches the basement that looks like the gates of Hades. That makes sense. So that that I think what you have to ask yourself is, could it simply be that a key part of this story is? A situation where multiple children are being treated a certain way and there's a need to cover that because it may lead to some kind of trouble uh and you know so so that that's what my mind is going to when i'm hearing that because the, there's something about the lie that what may be a lie that feels like you know an exaggerated um stretching in the opposite direction of the very true of the, the very thing that you're trying to hide i mean what do you guys think about that 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 might be part of the motivation to to conceal potential maltreatment or neglect. I, I think you're right on target, Evan, and the fact that children have not come home since since summer went missing. The state took them, took the boys. Yeah, and so so that that means there's a right to your point, Gary. I I think you're right on target. There's a huge huge story that we don't know about behind the scenes with child protective services in well, fact um, the families come out go ahead josh no, no 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 keep going keep going i'm sorry the families come out and said yeah they stole my kids <laughs> it's like you know seriously you know yeah and, it, and if you go back just seven days before that if, if you're looking at don and and his oldest son in the road there his oldest son's head was not shaved either it, it was it was hers and, you know, I don't know if Candace shaved her head or not. I mean, her hair is awful short there. But uh, I think that the, the consensus, at least with me, would be, yeah, that they were covering something. But, uh, I, you know, who knows who knows what? To come right. forward and explain themselves. I mean, if you're not a suspect, they at least come forward and say what you've seen. Mm. She was a tomboy. I shaved my head. She wanted to have her head shaved like me and the boys did. 
she tried to shave her head she tried in to the shave back her head and, and make it uh i think you can see it in some of the pictures and it was getting out of control so she we decided to shave her head off and let it grow back long and she shaved her head to to so she wouldn't feel bad and uh but but it didn't bother her at this point well we knew i knew right away that she was abducted you know i knew that right away and that's what i told them from the beginning but they have to they have to go through their you know i forget the word investigation they have to do one step at a time i guess but i'm sorry that they had to spend so many man hours in these woods and everything i've seen them limping and everything else you know and i feel for them but i always found that fascinating uh you know he said well i'm sorry they had to spend so much time out here uh but n not just that but you know even even the statements before don claims that he was at work all day that he wasn't there when summer was abducted but he knew right away that she was abducted and he doesn't question candace he doesn't question uh the grandmother uh, he he he's like yeah they that's absolutely what happened he knew right away that she had been abduct, abducted and that's to me the most unlikely of scenarios or one of the most unlikely of scenarios in this case that summer was abducted by a stranger uh and and this is what they're selling throughout this entire interview did anybody ever actually would. ask the children that supposedly talked to her before she went downstairs and got abducted? Do we know that really happened? Where the, the, the siblings saw her and then she goes down, breaks away from them, goes downstairs and gets abducted. Did anybody confirm that that really happened? No. What we know is the children were taken into protective custody. And what experience would tell us is there have been massive forensic interviews with those children, right? What, what I, I think I think they made a mistake, and it's always that one curveball. And Gary, tell me what, you, and Josh, tell me what you guys think. But had he said, or had she stuck with the swing idea outside of the house, that could have created the move in the in the victim risk continuum mm -hmm. to okay that means she's outside she's at a higher risk but once they put her in the basement now the risk shifts to the suspect right i mean don't don't you think gary i mean i it's a good point yeah it's a good point yes there was a way that neighbors could search neighbors houses and then if they're not willing you know get a search warrant or something but th there's just no way you can search every single house you know in the eastern united states or whatever okay stop there so for a second was a mm -hmm. also in his thought process he maintains an inside environment where she will be found okay she's got her he's got her inside environment in the basement and now he's saying she's on the, in another inside environment if you go search all the neighbors' houses. And I think that's part of his, his I, don't, I don't know what you guys would call it, Gary, but like his thumb. Tell. It's like a tell when you're playing poker yeah. with somebody and they're bluffing and they accidentally give something away if you're clever enough to notice it. Yeah. I think it's a tell. You know, well, and, and he was telling the police that, they were wasting their time looking, you know, in the house and that he, they're not, she's not here. Uh, you know, and they, they, they went through the entire house and, the, and searched that property. And he was, as he was saying, well, you know, she, she's not here. You guys are wasting your time. Uh, somebody took her. They're probably far away by now. And, and then, you know, in this interview, he wants to say, well, we, sh I wish we could just search neighbor's houses, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of, contradictory uh statements going on away just thankful for the person or persons that's doing that you know out of love trying it. trying to get information and trying to get her found 
We thank them from the bottom of our hearts. It means and, a lot. And we thank uh, everybody who's trying so hard and praying so hard. And she's an awesome young lady, and uh, we just want her back. But, yeah. yeah. There's always going to be haters, you know, and, you know, it's always going to be that way in this world. And we just want to. So initially, when this happened, um, right away, like a lot of cases, Facebook exploded with speculation, criticism of the parents uh, saying, you know, that they, you know, everything can kind of, you know, people come out of the woodwork and stuff like that. So he's he's addressing the neg- this hasn't this hadn't even really taken off on YouTube yet. This is really mostly just local locals and and people you know around the area kind of speculating and saying well yeah you know that something's not right so this is kind of who he's addressing right now focus on the the good friends and christian people that are trying to help us and praying for us and praying for summer guys i have your questions uh saved and i'll go over them uh, at the end and so i just want to let you know i'm not i'm not ignoring you you know we thank them from the bottom of our hearts and that's the, the kind of people we try to relate with and socialize with so we don't know anything about you know no red truck or we hardly know many of our neighbors i mean because we just try to be around good people i mean and we do have good people in this area we found out since this has all happened we got some real good neighbors and good folks everywhere. But uh, the most important thing is to bring Summer home safe. I'm sorry that you feel this way about us, but we love our children with everything we have. We've never went without, thanks to Summer's daddy and my husband. He's always provided for us and has worked as much as he could and can and still is. And I'm sorry that you guys feel that way, but that's my baby and nobody would ever treat her like that as long as I was around. Ever. Treat her like what? What I mean that that's just too much information. It's like treat her in her mind. She's thinking of something, but her mouth is saying another thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know. I think that she's talking about accusations of abuse uh, from online. You know, she's saying, "Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but I, you know, we love our kids with everything we have." And you know, to, to be quite honest with you, sometimes everything you have just isn't enough. She loves to dance. She, she would well, always want me. What journalist to... should have done is her job, and pressed her, and asked her a question: well, Have you ever had your children taken away? And if so, why? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that, yeah, they they were handled very gently by th- these interviews. But I think a lot of that, and it kind of happened on Doctor Phil as well. Candace, she doesn't want to do this. She now, and I can understand somebody not wanting to do this but for the sake of your child and their life i mean you should have an air horn on top of your house with a megaphone saying everybody listen where's my daughter at now i'm not saying that that's the kind of person don and that's the kind of people they are but you do what you have to do for for your child and and you know she does not like answering these questions she, you know, when Dr. Phil got a hold of her and the, the behavioral panel, she was saying, I feel like I'm being interrogated all over again. Don says, because he's a little more, for lack of a better term, polished than she is sometimes at speaking with people. He says, it's about summer or this is to help summer. And that's when she says, well, it's not helping me. This isn't helping me, uh, which I found, you know, just disgusting but nobody would ever treat her like that as long as i was around ever she loves to she loves to dance she she would always want me she says daddy hold my hand so i can twirl and she would she would just like to twirl and twirl and twirl till my arm got tired (laughs) you know but 
And we you know I I put out there that one of can uh, one of Summer's favorite songs was uh Godzilla and they say you know and they're jumping all over me about past tense was, you know, well I'm sorry about that. It's just she also liked the song um by a new breed. And she's apologizing for talking about her in past tense, uh, saying, you know, I, I don't mean to do that. And I'm I'm sure that 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 a lot of that could be accidental. Uh, but I mean, if you're if you think that your child has been abducted and that she's still alive, you really wouldn't go that far. But it bounces right back over to Candace and where she's saying well, uh, she liked this and she liked that. So, you know, right back to the past tense. It was called House. It's about past tense. Uh, Godzilla, and they say, you know, and they're jumping all over me about past tense was, you know, well, I'm sorry about that. It's just. She also liked the song um, by a new breed. It was called House, mm-hmm. My House. She sung that a lot of times when I play it on the TV. She loved to dance. She liked to think of herself as a princess and, uh, you know, and all that, like all young girls do. And, uh, she loved Frozen. She loved to be that Elsa. And Dr. Gary, do you make anything out of that? Uh, the the uh, past tense, uh, is that something that would raise a red flag to you? Or is it just maybe maybe they they just don't have that figured out it's complicated because i have talked to people who have authentically experienced things like losing children or other horrible events and trauma can make people do that slip in and out of what's past present uh like that because it's as if it's happening now when they talk about it and then the next thing you know it's in the past Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, if a person's making up a story, they could have trouble uh, where there were little slips of the tongue that kind of give away things. I think it's impossible to tell, yeah. uh, you know, but but it's it's interesting. It's one of those many things that you sort of dog ear as interesting in this situation. And when you put it all together, it has a, a kind of cumulative effect of feeling very fishy all over the place. Um, but you know, but who knows? I, you know, I just think it's worth thinking about that. Sure. It's a little fishy. And I'm sorry that you guys feel that ever. Arm got tired, <laughs> you know, but, and you know, I, I put out there that one of, can, uh, one of summer's favorite songs was, uh, Godzilla. And they say, you know, and they're jumping all over me about past tense was, you know, well, I'm sorry about that. It's just... She also liked the song um, by a new breed. It was called House, mm-hmm. My House. She sung that a lot of times when I play it on the TV. She loved to dance. She liked to think of herself as a princess and, uh, you know, and all that like all young girls do. And, uh... She loved Frozen. She loved to be that Elsa and... I think she really loved to be in church because she felt a lot of love there. And I think it's, you can't explain what that love is, but you feel it and you know it, you know, when you're young. And she felt that there and, and she loved everybody in that church or she loves everybody in that church. I should rephrase that because they'll tear that apart as past tense. And I apologize again for that. I hope she gets to come home, you know, and I hope she gets to be with our church family again. Our best friend in that yeah. church was Robin. She loved yeah. her to death. Yeah, she looked up to when women she, that were. She come to that church. She went looking for Robin. That was her favorite person. Any woman that uh, was professional, that was pretty, yeah, beautiful. she looked up to those kind of women. She, you know, they were. Uh, how do you, the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it. But... She looked up to him. She'd give him a run for the money every day. She'd give him a run for the money. And there was times, you know, we'd, we'd be, you know, that our boys like, don't do this and don't do that. And next thing you know, the stick would come up and just whop them, you know, and it'd be like, Summer, don't do that. You Summer know? was the boss of the family. Yeah, she, she 
Typical girl. And they'd get on a line, she'd put them in line. She'd do her best. She'd love to play in the mud and the water and swing on her swing and enjoy dirt. When I was, when I. So, to me, you know, like you said, this rosy kind of. You know, she loved to do this and she loved to do that. What the, I think. Pollyanna, the Pollyannish picture of a. Yeah. 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 And I think what they're, I think what the news is looking for is let's get some information out there about, you know, what happened that day, not this reminiscing of good times. Not that that, that isn't important to, to, to talk about, but I think that they were looking a little bit more for, you know, can anybody help us? Uh, this is, this is something that should be looked into. You know, we're doing everything we can. We're having a search party. Uh, you know, none of that stuff really ever went down. I run the lawnmower around. She, she would run behind me when the boys run their bikes around. She, as fast as that little bike could go, she would be behind them running and keeping up with them. No problem. You know, she loved to run. She just loved to run, and uh, she could pull herself up on that swing, her full body weight with her two hands, and she could do that. Nobody, none of the other boys can do that, but she can. Was she in school yet? No, no. she was going this year. This was supposed to be her first year. She's of been, uh, we did all the... What do you think about that, Dr. Gary? This was, she was not in school yet. This was going to be her first year. Well... Whenever an offense happens um, and you're thinking about someone as potentially implicated, although, you know, obviously we don't know what happened here, you always want to think about the precipitating factor. You know, what was the, the impetus for now? Why now? And if we do think of this potentially as a situation where you're eliminating somebody because they're they're going to talk too much or they're going to know, you know, they're going to know too much when people are asking about the other kids or you're going to get in some trouble or you'll reveal certain inappropriate things that happen to you that could be, you know, against the law or things like that. Um, and then you put that side by side with somebody being about to start school and um, that starts to perk your ears up. Um, because you're talking about a situation where somebody is now going to leave the intimate and private world in which you've been with them, and they're now going to be with other children and authority figures and people who aren't stupid, who are going to notice things about you, that you're acting a certain way, that you might have marks on you, that you might, and you're basically a walking, you know, body of evidence. And, um, and so in some of these cases where there is elimination of somebody for that reason, that, you know, it's sort of a mixed mode, right? Because if the child has been a victim of some things that may be perverse or whatever, and then on top of it, they're going to get you in trouble, then there is the possibility that they have to be eliminated for that reason. And a, a typical time you would do that is when they're about to be exposed to a whole soup of people that are going to see you and talk to you and know you. And um, so that struck me as very suspicious about this. But again, this is all, you know, speculation. speculation. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I just think the timing is very intriguing. And what you say, Chris, I mean, it's like when you think about the why now, it's very important. What are your thoughts on yeah. that supposition that I'm raising there? Well, I, I, I think it's also interesting and that the Child Protective Services had a scheduled visit just oh. before all of this had gone down too. I mean, that's, that's it. That in of itself, there's a tremendous amount of information being that, that we're not aware of. So they were coming over to that home to check on those children. Well, then lice would be particularly problematic. Uh, but, but Chris, wouldn't you say though, that it would be very odd for somebody concerned about that to have, you know, soft core porn on the, the thing down there, you know, <laughs> and the kid living in a place that looks like, you know, a bomb test site is very strange. It, it suggests that even when you try to look good at this, you're bad at it because it, it just, it reeks out of every pore, you know, that you, or, you, or, you know, but, but what do you think about this notion of um, that? I think adding to the lists of hypotheses that we mentioned at the beginning, 
the possibility of the child being dangerous because of what they could bear witness to. Yeah. Um, no, having experienced it. certain things potentially could cause a lot of trouble. And I, I love this question that just came by. Do princesses shave their heads? Right. Or play in the dirt. Right. Yeah. But, but what are your thoughts on that, Chris and uh, Josh? Josh? Well, I think, I think that everything about, I mean, this is just me, but I think everything about them is suspicious when it comes to summer disappearing. Um, and the fact that she was getting ready to go to school. I mean, this is, you know, what, this was in June. So, you know, within a month and a half, she's got to go to school. She's got to get her shots. She's got to go have a you know physical from a doctor I you know things like that um it it adds another layer of just what ex what exactly is going on here because the timing of that and, and saying well CPS was coming out or CPS was closing our case uh and then poof she's gone like her mother says just it, to me seems it's unbelievable well, I, I think it would be interesting to know if, you know, the CPS visit wasn't about uh, the, the idea of why is, uh, is summer registered for school yet? And if not, what's going on here? I, I mean, that, that in of itself, I can tell you from personal experience working with, uh, you know, CPS at that time, not, not these guys, obviously, but in my past um you know they're they're very suspicious about kids that aren't showing up at school and or aren't registered and they and they've had a history with this family and it's kind of like okay the boys are in school what's going on there okay yada yada now we've got the little girl you know what's the story with this does and do we know josh what uh, CPS, how or how? I, I know people have said they she's been reported on numerous occasions. The whole family has, but do we really know what that that visit was in, near and around the time she went missing? So we don't know. Let this is what Don says. So take it with a grain of salt, but that they were reported for the kids shooting guns on the property uh shoot you know with bb guns shooting dogs with bb guns things like that uh, that some somebody had reported that and I, I don't you know we don't know who but that's that was don's explanation as to why a cps case was open for them and you know well who would who would see them shooting guns on their own property uh, nobody you know what I mean? I mean, do, does the neighbor, you know, just kind of, I mean, they, I've been to that property. It is so secluded. You know, what is it? A neighbor with a pair of binoculars seeing the kids out there? Yeah. You know, shooting guns or shooting BB guns and knowing they're BB guns. I mean, that to me, just that in of itself doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely doesn't. It doesn't make any sense because like you said, who, who's going to, who's going to be the one to turn them in unless it was grandma, unless, unless it was grandma, who knows? Um, and, uh, it's just, it's just strange to me, but, but it does sound like you, you are, if I'm understanding correctly, you are both also compelled by the timing that school was about to begin, that it may have been, that that was part of the reason for looking at the kids or why there might be a special reason to kind of make things look rosy or whatever. But I think whether it's because of what could be found out once the kid is in school or what could be found out when people come in to see if the kid is ready for school, I think you still wind up with the same interpretation that yeah. there, that there is a, a you know, cause my strong, um, how do I say this? I think that we have to put on the table as a hypothesis, this construct that I talk about that I actually named <laughs> elimination murder. And, and, and I, I think 
the point of elimination murder when it's your own child is generally that you have done something to them. And if anyone ever found out about it, you would be in an awful lot of trouble. Uh, and so the child has to be eliminated. And when there is elimination murder, it is almost invariably um, hidden with a ridiculous cover story about an outside person doing it because it is the nature of narcissistic people to externalize blame. So you literally place the offender outside the house, coming into the house, instead of understanding that it's coming from inside the house, like symbolically and literally, right? So that we saw this in the Murdoch case, for example, with this phony intruder story. You see it in the Lizzie Borden case. I still don't believe Lizzie Borden was innocent, right? I mean, it's a ridiculous story about an intruder coming in and killing the dad and the stepmom brutally. For what reason, right? You know, didn't even rob anything. It doesn't make any sense. And um, so, Chris, I, I think in that list of hypotheses that we laid out, I have to tell you that the facts would be consistent with an elimination situation. Uh, and what are your thoughts on that, Chris? I, I think that is a high probability, no no question about it. It's, And I think we've gone down this slippery slope, you know, with them for so long and why the authorities, you know, I think the authorities, and this is just my personal opinion being there, and I've talked to some of the folks that were there. Right. The, the day of, the searching and everything. I mean, I, I've interviewed them and extensively. And one of the things that's always struck me is this idea that, um, well, we just don't know versus, okay, you know, there's, there's this process that you take that takes place. You know, you bring them in, you let them go, you bring them in, you let them go. And you go through this whole series of if it takes a month, two months or whatever, but it just seemed like, you know, the first couple of weeks, it was like, well, you know, we're not, we're not exactly sure. We know the parent, there's something there, but we can't put our finger on it. And even to this day, there's still, I would submit to you that they're still in that frame of mind. I, I've watched the interview with Pruitt, who is the lead, you know, case agent on this thing. And he's made it clear that, you know, well, we're not getting as many leads as we used to. Well, that's cop talk for, I'm not really working this case because I have a caseload. Okay. Uh, that's, you know, that's just my personal opinion. That's just my opinion. But I, I you know, I come, I come to the table with, you know, 41 years in this business. Right. And, you know, I kind of, I kind of have a, a thought process on this, but, and so, these guys, and I said this early on, very early in the in the investigation, Gary, to your point, that Don would continue to adapt and improvise his story in relationship to the type of information that flows out into the environment. And he has done that to a T. Every time there's something that comes up, okay, he fills in that gap. And then, of course, he starts, you know, filling it in with religion. And now he surrounded himself with a, you know, a core group of true believers, you know, no different than the people writing Koberger in jail, right, Gary? I mean, you, you, you can tell us about all that weirdness in and of itself, but he is now has a core group, even though the evidence is clear on some of the other offenses that he's been involved in in his life. And they're, they're still circling the wagons. And so you can't, I think the agency has to sit back and go, hey, well, how do we break through to this? How do we get through again to get back to put these two individuals back in an interview room? Because they've lawyered up right now. They're not talking to the cops anymore. Their five-year-old daughter has evaporated from the basement and they're not talking to the cops anymore. It's like, you know, really? <laughs> What's going on here? So I think the that event you know, to your point, the trigger of that event could well be, um, you know, the school thing, which could have, you know, processed into your theory of, you know, the elimination murder, which you have studied so deeply. Well, it's just one possibility that could meet the facts. I, But I think that, again, I just think we're talking about a situation where there have been no charges. So, I mean, we have to mm -hmm. always say we have no idea. But yeah. it, what, what bothers me is it can't be taken off the table. It's like, you know, this, that you have these 
sort of circles of truth, right? And that one cannot be eliminated. The facts would fall into that kind of picture. Well, let, me ask, let me ask you guys this. Let me ask you guys this question, both of you. Uh -huh. What would hold up this kind of investigation? Is it no body? Is it you know no confessions? I mean, what what is it with with everything that we know about? the case, meaning what the parents have said and uh, what law enforcement has said two and a half years down the road, we have children taken out of the home who have more. I know that they've been interviewed because Don has said, yeah, the, you know, the FBI has talked to the kids and uh, there's a no contact order with the kids. Don is not was Don wanted at one time to t talk to his oldest son and he actually got in trouble for trying to talk to his son because they said, do not talk about the case. Don't talk about your sister. He was very upset about that. He said, or don't talk about, you know, your daughter to, to your son. And, um, but what would hold this up? I mean, is it just, is it just not being able to put the pieces together? Is it, uh, could it be, have something to do with the, the children, uh, in, in custody uh, of the state. I mean, you know, you guys have seen, well, I think, and, and I'll, I'll answer from an investigative side. We're seeing it in this, uh, across the country. A lot of these district attorneys who are elected are hesitant for, because they want a perfect case. They want a perfect case, i.e. you want DNA. I mean, there's this expectation you're supposed to have DNA, you're supposed to have the body, you're supposed to have A, B, C, and D, and all this other stuff. Well, that's not how life works, though, sometimes. Sometimes, and Summer Wells, I would submit to you, is, is a circumstantial case. Okay, And if we think about that, what, what, what that really means is, is, and I'm just going to use this little notebook here, if you think of one piece of evidence as a line, a single line, and then you think of 10 pieces of evidence as more lines, okay, well, now you have a cable, a cable, okay? That's circumstantial evidence, okay? And if you can put 50 lines together, you have a really hard cable. A single line by itself will do this, okay? And jurors will go, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not enough evidence. <laughs> you can, I've seen cases where you can bring two cables to a DA. Okay. And if they've never had a high profile case this big, they hesitate. Well, we're not going to file charges because we'd like to see you guys find the body, find the body. So a police agency shifts their focus of just, you know, search and rescue, search and rescue, search and rescue. And, and then it just turns into a search, 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 because there's, you know, statistically the rescue part just goes out the window. And you, but even though right in front of them, they could have all of the answers. It's just sitting there and it's a cable. You can't break that cable. They just keep adding. I mean, if you look at a single pencil, and you keep adding 10 pencils, try to break 10 pencils okay, versus one pencil. Okay? And that's circumstantial evidence. DAs today, for some reason, are not prosecuting cases or at least putting them before a jury because either sometimes it's political in nature, i.e. they're elected officials and they don't want to lose the next election. So they're looking at the win column versus the justice column for the victim. Okay. That's, that's my personal opinion. Gary, uh, Dr. Gary, I want you to, we're just going to jump really fast to, I want you to hear what the district attorney has to say uh, about this case. It's a, a case that has, uh, implications of uh, the legal system and the law, but it's it, you couldn't classify it right now as there's no criminal charges been filed. Summer's older brothers were put into CPS custody last July, but no charges have been filed over their removal. However, their father, Don Wells, is serving time in the Hawkins County Jail over DUI and violation of probation charges. 
this is a very complicated issue um, that has been made more complicated by the, the the players in this drama. No one has been arrested or charged in relation. How would you interpret that, uh, Dr. Gary? Well, the phrase there, implications of you know that part is very intriguing because this is not a situation where somebody prefaces by saying, look, you know, we don't have any reason to believe anything happened here. It's a little puzzling, but, you know, these people seem innocent. And, you know, this is a what a tragic situation. If I mean, unless I'm misinterpreting what it comes across as is something's rotten in the state of Denmark in this story. So we can't take anything off the table, but nobody's been charged. And um, which is very different than saying nobody's been charged because there's no grounds or there's nothing that makes us suspicious or uncomfortable. Now, did you read it that way also? That 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 statement about the there are implications of that it that it feels like there may be something there, but we haven't gotten into it yet. I mean, the what way, do you think? The way that I interpret where he says that yeah. it's a complicated issue made more complicated by the players in this drama. Yes. Well, who are the players in the drama? Well, that would be the parents. Of course. Right. right. So he's he to me, what he's saying is there are implications of the law. Something happened. I can't define for you what it is that has right. happened. But the reason it's this this case is so difficult is because they have made it that way purposely. Which the parents smacks, which smacks of the previously raised point that it looks more like concealing than it does trying to help when you're trying to help with something like the potential death or abduction of your child you are an open book you would give your blood if you could to save your child and this feels more like people that are being obtuse and closed and tight and you know and i think that's sort of what the guy is saying is mm -hmm. you know why it's a little weird that it's being made infinitely more complicated than it has to be <laughs> by the players in this little drama i mean chris isn't how do you read it i think that's exactly right and i think if a lot of these agencies they hold back too much information and don't release it into the public arena because they're afraid that it will, you know, have an impact in the courtroom. I mean, and we just saw this. I mean, Gary, we just did the show uh, with the Marin family where, you know, I knew some things inside information about the hat, for an example. Nobody knew about that hat. I did. And I, and I finally got tired of it. And I said, let's just put it out there. Put the hat out there because that hat will identify the suspect. You can't hold on to that for so you know for so long. And lo and behold, that within a, what a day, the cops came out and said, "We don't know how they got that." You know who told them about that hat? But they did a podcast about the hat and confirmed, yes, in fact, this is the hat. Okay. This is, in my opinion, this is the same problem that's going on with Summer Wells. They have information that they could probably put into the environment that would absolutely flip this thing upside down. And it would create more leads into that agency. But for some reason, yeah, and I, I can't put my finger on it, but for some reason, they don't want to release that information out into the public arena. And what that does is normal families take the lead. They, they run to the media. Uh, you're seeing it with the Marin brothers. You're seeing it with Brandy and and Michael Vaughn. You're seeing it, you know, right out front. And then the cops, the, the agencies, law enforcement agencies, stand next to those families and say, they're not the ones we're looking at. They're the innocent ones. They're helping us. And in this case, the complicated, you know, characters here that the DA is talking about, well, they've lawyered up. Well, they've lawyered up. Well, you need to, they needed to say that a long time ago. They need to tell the public, you know what? The family's not cooperating, and we find that very suspicious. Thank you. You know, any more questions? You in the back. Thank Have you. either one of you ever worked a case where the parents weren't cooperating and they were in, completely innocent of everything, of anything? No. Okay. 
Hawkins County, I, County yeah. Jail over DUI and violation of probation charges. This is a very complicated issue um, that has been made more complicated by the the, the players in this drama. No one has been arrested or charged in relation to the little girl's disappearance, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen at some point. We uh, make ourselves available to both the sheriff's office and the TBI to, to advise them as to the consequences of the next step that they're proposing to take and how we can do it to where if there is a eventually a prosecution, it'll be uh, what they gather will be something that would be that, that we could introduce in a court make sure we cover all those bases and if an arrest and this doesn't that that doesn't to me sound like they're they're looking for an abducted child that's not what yeah. that sounds like to me from from the from the district attorney am i am i off on that no that's back room speak for we'd love a body yeah yeah get us we're, a body we're in the pocket we just can't whatever you know we we have who we're looking for we just we need to put this together and and and, and you notice the jur the journalist she's got somebody off the record that has told her some stuff okay because she she qualifies it with but that doesn't mean it can't happen no charges have been filed yet but that doesn't mean it can't happen okay right. i.e. somebody behind the scenes has said to her hey come here Ashley yeah what do you got okay off the record yeah okay blah 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 right okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. But you can't say that. Okay. I won't. Best ever does take place. That's when Armstrong will look at what charges can be filed. If it ever got to the point where uh, we were ready to consider charges, then of course they would talk to me about what charges and who to charge. And uh, a case like this would uh, generally go to a grand jury if it ever got to that point. Armstrong declined to comment about Don Wells' current legal troubles. Even though he stays in touch with law enforcement about where they're at in this investigation, he is almost at a standstill in his particular role. So you hear the district attorney that this this has been made more or this has been made this complicated issue has been made more complicated by the players involved. Uh, if at any time, you know, they're ready to bring charges. This is how we would go about it. They're not talking about an abducted child. I mean, that's not, that's not how he seems to be viewing this case. And which like, like you said, backroom talk for, we would like a body. Uh, Dr. Gary, it's very important to note that after they searched initially, they followed up on some, uh, areas of interest in the middle of the woods months later looking. Okay. Uh, that doesn't sound like they're looking for an abducted child to me at that point either. It looks like they're looking for a child that something bad has happened to and has been hidden away. Well, it's complicated because abduction could be followed by killing and burying a child. I mean, it doesn't preclude abduction, it just means that the kid is not sold into enslavement or something somewhere or being kept as a, you know, as their own child somewhere in the house or something like that, or in a, you know, in some kind of prison or it, it's, it suggests that whatever it is that happened, there is a, perhaps a suspicion that it culminated in the elimination of the child and concealment of a body. I agree that the absence of a body is the whole issue here. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, uh, oh Lord, who is it that used to say it? Was it Stalin? It's a famous quote, no body, no problem. I think it was Stalin. Right. And, um, but, but the idea being that, you know, if, if there's no body, well then what, what are you going to do? I mean, what you can't, you, you charge somebody for something and the kid turns up, you know, it's complicated. I mean, Chris, wouldn't you say having a body would, would be the game changer, of course, in this situation. That's yeah. the thing piece. Yeah. And um, the question, of course, is if we operate under the hypothesis that she dies in that house, that no one ever comes and takes her out of the house at all, then how do they eliminate the body? Yeah, they move the body. And let's say, you know, well, we don't even know if, if the house is in play. I mean, no. we don't we don't know if there's a car in play. We don't know if there's something that happened outside. Uh, and, you know, there's a 
There's theories of, you know, dry drowning, all these other things, right? But we definitely know the narrative in relationship to what the parents say. And the parents have this scripted conversation. They've stuck to it till it sticks to you. And they just haven't been, you know, one of the things that threw them off in the beginning was the fact that their sisters, you know, Don's sisters came forward. That I mean, that was like a, a curveball out of left field for them. And Don spent so much, the, the, the father spent so much time, you know, just going after his sisters that he lost focus of his daughter. And then he was getting outside, you know, circles of saying, well, no, this is this, you know, you need to refocus back to your daughter. And, but he had other people doing that for him. He wasn't, he, he had other people doing that for him right? because it came to the point where the authorities in Utah opened up an investigation and lo and behold, they turned that investigation and people forget this. They turned that investigation over to the DA's office. And the DA's office said, well, you know, it's out of the statute of limitations. They didn't say it didn't happen. They just said the statute of limitations doesn't apply. It does, you know, it's out of, out of whack. Sorry. But we're not saying you weren't a victim. Mm. Right? So that stands as factual information. And, and that means that could all be admitted into court later on down the road. Okay. And this in this situation, there has been so many, you know, fastballs and curveballs and knuckleballs that, you know, the catcher, i.e. the DA, he's not sure, you know, how to catch it and put it in. Well, the hypothesis that was raised in a previous discussion the three of us had that I thought was very intriguing is that it's understood as I understand it, there, there was a couch that had blocked the door that supposedly would have been the, the um, egress, you know, for the, for somebody in that place. And um, that the hypothesis was put forward. I don't know if it was by you, Josh, or by you, Chris, that perhaps the child was in the couch and the couch was taken somewhere and incinerated or crushed or whatever as a means of eliminating evidence. Now, if there's any truth to the notion that the point here was to conceal something that may have been ha happening to the child, you can bet that the idea would be to eliminate as much of that body as you can, because even if a corpse is found, the corpse would have markings and you know, there would be signs of, there could be signs of sexual trauma, there could be signs of bruising, there could be signs of ligatures, there could be signs of, you know, etc. Chris, I mean, you know, you and I are, have seen it all in terms of what can happen and to a corpse. And I, I just kind of think that um, that's the kind of situation where, you know, consistent with people who know a thing or two about that kind of forensic science, even just from an, an amateurish you know, knowledge of, of cr true crime would try to eliminate as much of the body as they can. And, um, and that's why I'm afraid that there may not be much of a body if this is a, a death situation, because there would be fear that the body itself could tell the very thing that may have been the point of concealment. Uh, you don't need to talk, you know, a body can say an awful lot too. Uh, wouldn't you say, Chris, I mean, I'd be suspicious of a, of really eliminating uh, this, you know, very, very far away or like incinerated or et cetera, yeah. really gone. I think it will go back to, you know, let's, let's just say there was SA in the past with mm -hmm. whatever, okay, hypothetically with the family, i.e. the sisters, et cetera. Okay, we know that's factual in nature, number one. Let, but we, you know, we presuppose that could have been a, a, a pattern habit, you know, a, a habit pattern in relationship to, you know, projecting it forward, right, with the other kids. We don't know that, though. That's We don't have evidence of that other than what had happened in the past. Right. 
So let's hypoth. Let's just say and then say, okay, let's say dad's not home. Okay. He's at work, or as he says, you know, I wasn't around, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that could be true. That could be true. There's a there's a there's a possibility that, that could be true. However, mom is at home. She's at home with that baby, and she was the last one to see that child that day. So that puts her in a higher category of, and I find it really interesting that she has been the one that most 90% of the time has said, I don't want to talk about this. I'm shutting my mouth. Well, and if and if we look at what what her their history is in that family, she's got a sister who vanished in Wisconsin. And she's MIA. She's never been found. Okay. Now, and this also then puts Don in a position of he gets a phone call, hypothetically. Hey, blah, blah, blah. You need to get home. And now he is just what we would call a PC-32 accessory after the fact. And, and he's going to lock up because he's been, you know, his history. And it's really all potentially on the other person and this and one of the interesting statements that he made a long time ago was i've got seven alibis she's got zero i mean josh tell us about that again refresh our memories on that so there was a it was a drunken night when dawn was on a alive uh, pretty unorganized but most of them with him and candace are and this was when he was speaking much more frequently um he 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 makes this comment while he's on there talking about how he was at work all day that starlink whatever in his car is his alibi and then he says he repeats it twice he says i have seven alibis candace ain't got none she's going down so then obviously everybody freaks out and is like okay well what you know, what's that about? Well, then, you know, when you get him after the fact a month or two later, he said, well, I was, I was just, I was ribbing. I was giving her a hard time. I was just, I was just talking trash, uh, which is heartless. If, if, you know, he, if, if he's the one that is involved in this, but to, but to rib Candace or people, in general, I mean, they, they like to play uh, jokes as well. They, they played a joke on uh, Don's stepsister saying that Don had been arrested, but they didn't know for what. And then the internet kind of blew up with it and it was a whole rigmarole. None of it was true. Candace fake cried. Don thought it was hilarious. Uh, but the, yeah, he, he literally said out loud, Candace, or I have seven alibis. Candace has none. She's going down, uh, which is just, to me insane i think they're going to turn on each other at some point that will be that will be the deciding factor when don and candace have had enough of each other that if in fact you know they had some involvement in this child's disappearance and their own child's disappearance and they're innocent you know as we keep talking allegedly but at this point, that the, what's going to turn this over will be the two of them going, he did it, no, she did it. Mm -hmm. And grandmother, who is also now had a stroke, my understanding, I, I, I just read that. I don't know if it's true or not. And do we know if it's true or not, Josh? Uh, she did have a, yeah, she did. Okay. So she's not, you know, she's kept her mouth shut all this time. Why? is still another mystery to me. This is her granddaughter and who she handed allegedly candy to. And all of a sudden now she doesn't want to talk about it. No, it's something's wrong in river city here. And, but I, I really think those two are going to flip on each other. They're going to flip out. Gary, what do you, what do you think? I, I think it's interesting about the grandmother. I mean, if the, the hypothesis that we're proposing here, uh, would suggest that anyone who is in a dependent position on the people who are the caretakers in that home would be 
kind of scared of them or would play along because, I mean, you know, you'd be in a lot of trouble if you didn't. And, um, you know, so that I think what you'd get is people that kind of keep their mouth shut, you know, <laughs> because otherwise they'd be in a lot of trouble. Well, they had a month with the children uh, after summer went missing. They had a, a month to, you know, tell them what to say or not what not to say i'm not and i'm not suggesting that they did that i would but i would think that, that there's a possibility that that happened and uh, that could also be to me a hang up is that you know they've been working with the children uh, trying to you know uh not not break them but more so just get them to open up about what really happened uh, they've been programmed maybe to not tell the truth uh, or that they're scared that they're going to, I mean, these kids do not want to go back home. Don has admitted that the children have said that they don't want to be there anymore. Uh, uh, and it, it would take a really very difficult uh, living environment for a kid to be pulled away from their, their biological parents put into a different situation and go, you know what? We don't want to go back there because we didn't like it all right and so that sounds like where that has kind of ended up i don't believe under any circumstances that they're getting their children back uh and uh nor do i think that the children want to go back and that's according to don and candace uh that candace was upset that that that, that happened um so i think that that could be part of the hang up as well mm. You know, I wanted to ask, um, because in all the review that we've done together of this case, the, one of the things that gave me the creeps more than anything else was that video of the kid swimming and that whole story about the stranger at the swimming hole and the whole thing, and then the phone disappearing. Uh, that, that always struck me as disturbing because it felt to me like the phone is mysteriously missing because there'd be like a timestamp associated with the video when it was actually created. And I, I just had the sense that the video was not from the day that it was uploaded, that it was to make it look like a kid was around who was already not there. And, and then you make up a witness and everything who mysteriously can't be found and who might be the intruder watching her, you know. But it, my sense was that there was a possibility that the video was a couple of days old and then you sh you upload it to look like it's from now, but you get rid of the phone because you'd have a timestamp of when the video was actually created on the on the original video. So what would be the point of doing that? Well, that to to create the artificial impression that somebody is alive longer than they were when they're actually off somewhere, you know, already being eliminated or something like that. So I was really bothered by that. And it. What do you guys? Did you guys also find that whole story very suspicious about the, the phone missing, and all that, or is it just me? Well, I no. don't. Was there? A, I don't know if there was. A, was there a phone missing, Chris? Well, I remember the part where she says she, she called nine one one and she couldn't get through, and then she threw Don's phone, yes, right. or the phone, whatever it was, and all of a sudden went to her mother's phone. I mean, I I always thought that was kind of a red flag. Oh, right. You know, yeah. Why Why are you flipping phones off over here? You know, well, the you don't get good reception. Well, how did you? How did the second phone get good reception and the first one didn't? They're they're hitting the same cell tower. You know that that just didn't make sense to me. Oh, mm -hmm. but what do you think about the idea that that video was not created when it was made to look like it was created? It, I, that uh, I it wouldn't anything would su would not surprise me at this point uh, in this case. Uh, I think though that that would be a really huge footprint that they have digitally, uh -huh. and and that they again we go back to you know this idea of you know Candace told me directly. I asked her. I said, "So so tell me about this." you know, polygraph, for an example, was she stopped midstream. Everybody can see it. They can go watch it on the video. And she says, well, you know, uh, I, I just couldn't do it that night. Okay. Well, why? 
And she later tells me that, you know, she was high as a kite. Okay. <coughs> and the, when she got down there, the polygrapher said, you know, no, we're, we're not going to do this right now. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. So that statement right. caused me some concern to where it was, well, hmm. It just seems like everything just keeps leaning in, in a certain direction. I mean, I, I, I would submit that the phone, you know, Candace has the phone. Candace has the video. Candace has the last view with the child. Candace has, you know, A, B, C, and D, you know, saw her last. Oh, by the way, I had to walk her over to the house. You know, all of these things, right? Can And this is another one. Thank you, uh, Peace and Happiness. She did say at the water hole, she didn't turn over her other phones, okay? that the cops, you know, missed a phone. And, and that's... I, she was going to get down to do it. She just hadn't gotten around to it. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. Okay. Right. So, I and mean, it's then, very uh, odd. Chris, you'd be handing over everything you have. Everything. Your child. You'd say, for God's sake, you know, take me with you when you go searching. I, I won't be able to sleep. I've had parents hand me, you know, go into the bathroom and, you know, we'd ask them for, you know, do you have a toothbrush? Do you have, you know, do you have a, a hairbrush? Do you have anything that belongs to your child? Oh, yeah. You know, buckets of stuff start coming. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, that's fine. I just need this, this, and this. That's fine. And we'll put them into bags. Okay. In this case, yeah, you know, the phone thing is a is a good example. And, and you're right, Gary. This is, that's it. I think early on, we did a whole thing of uh, flags, red flags. And and quite frankly, I, we ran out of, we ran out of red flags. I don't have any more oh, flags to give. We didn't have any more flags. We got balloons with flags. Right. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, Lord. Oh, they they didn't come this time. Oh, right. they're coming. Trust me. Dang it. No balloons. <laughs> anyway. Like like Gallagher. Where's your... Oh, what the heck was that? But, no but, but, I, but I, I have to tell you, though, that I think the point about the, the video may be from a different day is interesting to think about because it suggests such a at least the potential for such a crafty sneaky manipulative thing to do you know to garner sympathy to look like parent of the year the whole thing it would really be truly hideous if there were any truth to that it's rather devious i mean yeah. you have to picture a couple of people you know thick as thieves you know sitting together kind of coming up with something that's a disturbing image I, I hope I'm wrong. Let's put it that way. But yeah. I'm suspicious of it. Uh, but, you know that it could have been from a little while ago. Well, they have. They you can bet they have all of that, right? They've they've downloaded it. They got search warrants. I'm sure they've pulled it all together, and and it's up on a wall somewhere, uh, in in a war room, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But the uh, yeah, to your point, that's a that's a very solid point. Like, but if the, phone, if the phone was destroyed, could law enforcement still determine it, where it was up, that it was uploaded from a different phone at a different time, yeah. you know, what, but they wouldn't be able to tell when the video was filmed without the original phone. Well, you'd need a timestamp on it. And of course you'd have to, there is, there is some technology mm -hmm. that you can get, you know, certain information, but not necessarily all the time you're going to get it a hundred percent. So. Yeah, that worries it. me. Yeah, but the best thing to do is it's it's sort of like the point about the body. No phone, no problem, right? It's like complete elimination of it, and then you got no trouble. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's the thing that disturbs me about this story. I want I want you to uh, to listen to the lead investigator. Uh, it's just a couple minute uh, clip here, and I know we're running a little long here, so I don't want to keep you guys forever. Um, but, uh, well, today, for the first time, we are learning the lead investigator in the Summer Wells case is speaking out. The pressure has been immense on the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office to figure out what happened to a little girl who reported missing back in June. Ansley Daniel has been following this case closely. She has an update, Ansley. Josh and Sarah, there was frustration, some anger, and the presence of a heavy burden when I sat down with the detective John Pruitt with the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office. He's led this investigation into Summer's disappearance. He told me that as difficult as this case is to work, he is nowhere near giving up. 
It was a lot to shoulder, it was a lot to burden. Uh, we have a missing child that we haven't found yet. Almost 10 months and so much heartache. And investigators aren't immune from that hurt. The question of what happened to Summer Wells still has no answer. There haven't been very many cases like this. Um, I have never worked a missing child case with all these different entities and agencies involved. The lead investigator on the case says his days are devoted to finding her. My day, I check tip line and voicemail when I first get here. I do phone calls and follow-ups on any credible leads I've got. I follow up on anything that I didn't get to a good conclusion the day before. Then I go into my normal caseload of any new cases I've got, uh, follow-ups on them. They've received nearly 2,000 tips. I will follow up on everything I can to try to bring closure for this. Self-proclaimed online investigators and social media sleuths have turned this case into a mess of ideas. And tips have come in from everywhere across the U.S. and even overseas. That help, Pruitt says, has led to little more than time wasted. If these people want to help so much, we always accept applications to certified individuals. He says the investigation has led to the continued thought that if Summer is found, it will be nearby. I believe that she would probably be somewhere close by. Because we found nothing to, to lead us to believe that she's been abducted or trafficked out of the area. Pruitt works alongside the TBI and FBI. Along with the ground search, Pruitt says investigators have poured through data. Almost a year into the case, and Detective Pruitt says it still remains a very active investigation. I'm not going to let it go cold. Well, Detective Pruitt assures that what happened to Summer Wells is still being investigated daily. Tonight at 6. All right, and then, oh, hold on one second. The, there's a second part. And let me, here, it's right here. And months and still no answers. Tonight, News Channel 11 dives deeper into the disappearance of Hawkins County six-year-old Summer Wells. For the first time, we have heard from the lead investigator with the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office. And tonight, he tells us what this investigation looks like right now. Josh and Sarah, the case of Summer Wells does not look much different today than what it did when I first reported live on authorities searching out in Beach Creek back in June of last year. Now, authorities are spending more time than ever before fielding through false tips as well as false hope. It's sporadic. Um, I mean, one day you might get five leads. The next couple of days you might not get anything. But it's been an active investigation that uh, I've been devoted to since it first occurred. As Summer's disappearance approaches the 10-month mark, the scenarios of what happened the night of June 15th continue to grow. The wandering away, uh, sneaking off to go play or, or whatever she may have done, it, that is a viable option. The night she went missing, authorities said she walked away from her house. The following day, an Amber Alert was issued. People are probably tired of hearing this. All possibilities are on the table. We're not completely eliminating the abduction idea, but there's nothing to lead us to believe um, that we need to focus on that alone. In the height of the search, those on the ground combed through miles of tough, rugged terrain, leaving many to wonder how there was no trace of Little Summer. She was like three foot, 40 pounds. It would be a lot easier for her to get through some of the foliage. And she's lower to the ground, smaller body, a lot more flex. Along with the ground search, Pruitt says investigators have poured through data. We have gone through reams and reams of data. We've collected statements. We've chased down every credible lead that has been given to us. And we are still not much further along than when we started. Anybody? Surveillance videos, um, GPS locations, cell phone tracking, cell phone data, electronic data. Uh, anything that we could think of to get our hands on. As time continues to pass since that June day, it's increasingly hard to hold on to hope. Well, we're nine months ago. Um, I would hope that she is still alive somewhere, but we also have to be open to the idea that that uh, is no longer a possibility. 
Pruitt says that he has never worked a case like this with so many different entities involved. And he says it's still baffling that it looks the same as it did that night that Summer was reported missing. Coming up tonight at 11, we learn more about Summer's family's relationship. Uh, so later on, and, and I'll spare you, they talk about the relationship with law enforcement and the, the sheriff, Sheriff Ronnie Lawson, says on a interview they she asked are the parents still cooperating with law enforcement and he says no they're not cooperating uh they they have lawyers and that was really the last time that we had heard from ronnie lawson about this case uh, at i believe it was either the one year or the two year mark tbi said somebody asked are the parents still cooperating and the the spokesperson for TBI says, I don't want to define cooperation or something along those lines, which to me, that's a yes or no answer question. She said that, you know, what she said was that it doesn't help the case uh, by, by saying something like that. But, you know, I, I just find, I find it just um, very strange that, Law enforcement says, you know, at the beginning, which you would be more inclined to cooperate. But as time goes on, they, they're saying, you know, now we're, they're no longer cooperating. Uh, they have lawyers, so, and, which, again, Don and Candace deny, which is just another thing uh, that uh, doesn't doesn't surprise me. But, you know, what are your what are your thoughts about the where he said that? the traffic out of the area. I found that kind of interesting that he kind of, he said it the, the way that he said it. Was there anything to that? I was curious what Chris thought of that, given Chris's background. What do you think of that, Chris? Well, you know, this, it reminds me so much of Letitia Hernandez. I mean, there's, it, it's a, it's almost a layover and outside of who the suspects, the suspectology here. But one, a couple of things that struck me, uh, you know, he, he criticized the, you know, the citizenry sleuths or whatever he wants to call them. Okay. When it is citizens who actually solve sometimes these types of crimes. And that told that told me volumes about you know you don't tell the public you know we we accept applications okay, to come to work here. It, I'm meaning if you think you've got all the answers, well then just file an application and we'll see if you qualify. Mm. Number one, okay. In a case like this that has so much that has so many moving parts to it. The fact that there's one guy that's looking at this and saying in the same breath, well, I check my phone, I check my voicemail, I check my emails, and then I follow up on viable leads, and if there's nothing else, I go check my caseload. Now, that what that tells me is there's maybe, an, you know, depending on the, the length, of the, the leads coming in, i.e. The, the depth of the information, it tells me that his supervisor is still handing him cases and saying, hey, you know, Frank, over here, we've got a stolen toaster. Okay, you need to investigate this. And, and that tells me the shifting of the tide has already taken place with inside of that agency. And, and this is why the cold, one of the reasons the cold case – foundation exists okay. uh, because agencies run out of resources. I will guarantee you the Federal Bureau of Investigation is not working this case. Okay. They got to a point where they said, okay, guys, you know, thanks a lot. Now, they may get a phone call that says, hey, we got a lead over in this state or this state or that state. They'll assign a couple of field agents to go out and do those interviews and chase them down. 
They'll do that 24 7, 365. You don't even need to, you know, put them in the bucket. But they're not actively working this case. TBI is probably supporting the sheriff's department. And the fact that he's getting so many crazy leads, i.e., you know, from, from weirdness and craziness, you see this cup? I earned this cup. It's called McRock Pile. Okay, this cup right here from my agency. Okay, the reason is because I was assigned to chase all the craziness. Well, the other people were working Leticia Hernandez. This agency is not doing that. That that should have never made it to the public in in terms of even a comment, in my opinion. It should have never have been said, you know, well, you know, if you've we're only chasing down, you know, blah, blah, blah. An agency wants every single person who has an idea or thought to pick up that hotline, that tip line, and call in and say, hey. This may not be anything. And if you look at Letitia's case, it was the first time in the country, in the United States, in 1990, where she was profiled three times on America's Most Wanted by John Walsh. Three times. Okay? That had never been done before. Do you know how many thousands of phone calls we had? And back then, you just write it on a piece of paper. The phone number would, you know, and I can't tell you how many thousands of people I picked up the phone and I listened and I ended up getting this cup, McRock pile, because I also went out with psychics and they were, you know, oh, they're, you know, I feel a vibration over here. Okay. Well, you know, Hey, we're going to get a, a tractor out here. And we're going to dig this up. Okay. It was city cruise, by the way. That had to do that. The maintenance department, I can't tell how many, how many guys I called and said, dude, get out here with your shovels. <laughs> yeah, why? Uh, we've got another one. Okay. But the point being, you have to do it. You have to do it. You've got to just check it out because these high profile things like this are huge. And the fact that he said, I go back to my daily caseload. That spoke volumes to me. That spoke volumes. Mm -hmm. Why do you tell the public this is a priority? Letitia's case is a priority. Oh, but I've got a daily caseload. Well, guess what? That agency hasn't hasn't you know sucked it up yet and said, what's it going to take to solve this? Well, it's going to take more than one guy. That's what it's going to take. But and in they fair, Chris, you could imagine the having to sift between the bizarre and the plausible in terms of the messages they get and the calls they get. Yeah. I mean, Chris, we know even from, well, not only from our work, but the podcast world, that what happens is you got you get a lot of very well-meaning people who want to help, who don't connect dots in the way that a detective or a shrink might. They connect yeah. dots in a way that Sort of head scratching, career, you know, or you might get people who you know are kind of paranoid or malicious or other things, and you know that for every one useful piece of information, there are nine pieces that are bizarre or or throw you totally off track. So you could just imagine when that when this became high profile, they must get hundreds of well, and thousands, and right. and that's that's my point, Gary, because. That goes gets assigned to a guy like me, hypothetically. Yeah, and that's all that person does. While the while the case agent, whoever that you know is Pruitt, that guy is just focused on Summer Wells. He's not focused on all this other craziness out there. Okay? Right. And in and in this case, it what I just heard him say was, "I'm focused on everything." Mm -hmm. okay. I'm focused on all the craziness. I'm focused on, you know, hey, if you think you're a better detective than me, then file an application, come on in and work for us. Okay. And and that's frustration. 
is what I hear in his voice. I'm not I'm not saying he's doing anything wrong, him personally. Oh, you just imagine though what the day must look like. Right? Yeah. But I've been in that seat. Exactly. You know, I've 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 a thousand, you know, a lot. I've been in that seat. So you're no stranger to the weird red no. herring calls and the peculiar. I mean, you know, we yeah, right. I mean, it's his job, right? I mean, is that kind of what yeah. you're saying there, Chris? Yeah, I have a, I have a cup. The territory, right? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. and uh, and I'm not look. I've seen even on YouTube and just reading about there have been some just crazy, you know, theories yeah. and calls. And I, I, I yeah. And I understand the, the that it is a frustrating, thing, especially when you you don't have the resources that you need, when you don't have all the time that you need to investigate. And, you know, if you're chasing down leads in between, uh, you know, stolen tractors or, you know, not trying to make light, I'm just saying that whatever crimes are going on out there, those also have to be investigated, looked up, you know, and, and prosecuted. Uh, but go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I, here, here's, a, here's a big clue. Here's a big clue. If Hawkins County had some crazy guy out there abducting children and murdering children. Gary, would he have struck by now? Oh, there's no question. The, in fact, I was having a similar thought, you know, great minds think alike, I guess I was thinking, I was thinking that, um, that is the kind of behavior where an individual would keep doing it. And the evidence of somebody who does it in that snatching way is that they'd be a local, so you'd get a kind. This is the same thing that comes up with Delphi, right? You you would have a a few of these in the same place, <laughs> right? It, it, to to make the profile make sense, it would be that kind of. Per and um, uh, what bothers me about it is, where did this abductor go? Up in smoke? Doesn't make any sense. Now my question is, um, am I correct that it has pretty much been concluded that there is no evidence of a home uh, abduction? Of a home invasion with an abduction is that has has that been definitively said or are we saying that no i think the card team said basically you know we're not seeing any evidence of an abduction and and the, he's got to say and uh, he's got to say that and he did okay we're not saying there wasn't some type of an abduction i.e then he qualifies it right behind that with you know, like a trafficking or something to that effect, basically. I mean, that's my interpretation of what he was saying. Okay? I mean, I because there is there is no evidence other than this red herring red truck that was introduced into this conversation early on, but it wasn't necessarily through, you know, some that I, I know you I think we all can agree that there may have been a red truck driving by or something to that effect and all the, the canvassing of the neighborhood. And somebody said, yeah, I saw a red truck go by. Okay. But that night, they didn't put an Amber Alert out that night. Mm -hmm. They waited till the next day. And well, <laughs> but this is what I'm getting at. The, there's a, um, you know, anyone who knows me knows about my, my love of Sherlock Holmes. And um, there's a story... Uh, uh, in which you have a situation where somebody has been killed and Holmes and Watson are investigating the house. It's in the sign of four. And they're investigating the room in which it happened where one of the two twin brothers is, is sort of killed by a, a toxin. And the door is locked from the inside and the windows are snibbed from the inside. And it's not possible to get into the window by climbing the wall, right? So, and there's no trap door, nothing. So Watson can't figure it out. Had anybody get in there and commit this murder? And Sherlock says to him, how many times have I told you my precept? When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. And then Watson thinks for a second. He says, ah, he must have come in through the roof. And then they realize that he had to have come in that way. And there is a skylight that communicates with the outside. And the per so, the, and it's sort of like that. So if you eliminate the impossible, what, what if you eliminate the idea that there was a home invasion, what remains? 
an abstinent walk away except or right. homicide. <laughs> what possibly remains if you take that off the table? Right. And and that I think is where why I say with a kind of confidence that I think we can't take off the table the, the possibility of some kind of inside situation, right? And, oh, because, and because all the other things I think they just have to be removed as probable from the table. And I guess the only thing that prevents some kind of formal formalization of that or you know is the absence of a body. Um, I, I am sure that if there was a body that, that they would have this very similar logic, but hey, you know, we, we can't cast dispersions. But I have to say, I think Sherlock is right in that regard, uh, because there isn't much left <laughs> other than that. I mean, Chris, uh, 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 Josh, can you think of any other alternative if there's no home invasion and abduction? Uh, I no. No, I can't, and and I and I've tried many times, and I've you've even kind of pushed the, pushed the bounds of what was possible, and without look, Doctor Gary, the what they're in, what they're saying is that a man or a, just an entity in the middle of the day, walked up a steep hill, loaded to the gills with animals that bark, viciously at strangers. Knew where to go to hide from at least five different people. Get to the basement, which is basically, allegedly, there's a couch in front of the door. The door is always locked. They can't get in that way. That a person walked through the living room where the boys were dropped down that hole or somebody sitting in there and made off with a five-year-old child down basically a cliff and escaped with not being detected at all. So no, absolutely not. I, I, there, there is. That, it's me, you're, saying, you're suggesting it's impossible that it falls into the yes. impossible that has to be eliminated. Yes. So <laughs> that's, so, I mean, I think the point is if you follow the trail of this conversation tonight, what, the way I'm seeing it and the way I've seen it from the beginning is that in all fairness, you know, in a kind of a thought experiment, we said these are the three buckets into which hypotheses seem to fall about this case, right? And then by a kind of process of elimination, you wind up with this, that there's no other way to go other than this, like, so that if you're investigating it, isn't your thought process going to go down there? Well, the only thing that would prevent it is the lack of clear evidence. I mean, first of all, these are people that live there. What DNA are they going to look for? What hair are they going to look for? What okay, They live there. They're all over the place. Everything right. that's there is going to be theirs. So right. That, right? So that, that, that that's, again, that makes me think of Delphi, like when they were thinking about the owner of that land, Ron Logan. You know, it's like, what in his DNA and hair and everything be all over the place? It's his property. Of so that, yeah, right. So, so that, that, that's something that kind of bugs me. Right. And so, and that's the other piece of it is how could a person do this and not leave a single trace? That's also impossible. This is 2024. Did the guy go in there in a hazmat suit or something or <laughs> would like pluck every hair out of his head before, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, a guy with a hazmat suit went up a steep hill <laughs> right. in the middle of the day with five people and 13 dogs and got away scot-free. No, not only that, they'd be a disorganized offender that's snatching a child because they have no social skills, but they're also clever enough to put on the hazmat suit. Yeah. And they wait for the child to randomly come down because their descent into the basement is not a planned event. So they're indefinitely waiting for the for the child to come. In other words, it, it, to an intelligent person, it's a ridiculous story, and um, so that I, that 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 truly truly bothers me. But again, because no charges have been filed, I think we have to we have to be open to anything. I, but and here's you know, a question: for It bugs me. I mean, let's put it that way. Chris and Doctor Gary, can you explain why the well-being of the boys would be priority? Uh, safety takes time. If they were present, 
uh, and why the account of events would not be rushed. Thank you. And that's a uh, vet girl, a uh, great um, supporter of the summer wells uh, community. I, and, yes. I think it's a good question for Chris. <laughs> I think the child uh, protective services always have to put the welfare of the children first in relationship to a forensic interview. There could be some, so many mitigating factors when they talk to the other children, the boys, uh, that they would want to have a trained, you know, um, adolescent or children's uh, psychiatrist speak with them. And, and that could take uh, months and months. Am I right, Gary? I mean, they, they could, yeah. they could be in a decompression mode where they can compartmentalize information and, you know, we don't know what type of, you know, environments they were subjected to in relationship to, you know, maybe violence of, of some sort. Maybe they witnessed it. We don't know. They but could be petrified. They could be petrified. Traumatized. Who knows? Is it possible that they could, I mean, say that, you know, because in the, in the, it was the West boys, uh, Cal city boys, there, the siblings ended up testifying uh, to what happened. It took a couple years. Is that something that they could be preparing them for, possibly? That is a high price, possibly. Anything's possible. Yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, going back to my my point uh, is, of why this could be held up. I mean they they have dam it, they have damaged children psychologically what happened their sister vanished they've been they've been pulled out of the only home that they've ever known and as somebody that's had that happen before by the way it's traumatizing and it takes a long time to get your sea legs underneath you your bearings are off and everything that you had known before then is gone you're relearning the entire world from a different perspective okay how many years did you go through counseling Jill? Uh, well, I started about three, maybe about three. And I ended, uh, the intense therapy probably around 16 or 17, uh, and then off and on for years after that as well. So it, it is, it, it is such a traumatic experience. Uh, it would not surprise me in the least if this is what's really holding, uh, holding things up and um, let me uh, pull up another we'll, we'll uh, we're pushing time here. So I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, I fear the will Wells may get away with the crime. Chris is the, is the cold case foundations offer on the table still 24 seven. It's, it's not going anywhere, right? Nope. Yeah. And, and that, that is uh, very important to note and look, and that's no disrespect to any law uh, enforcement agency. That's an offer that has been taken up by many, many. Uh, Fruitland took it up. They sure did. They sure did. I mean, if, if they need a, a reference, give them a call. Um, thank you very much for that as well. Chris is uh, there no regulation or oversight in the U S uh, uh, jud judiciary. To, to, hold on, sorry. That could remove departments from a high-profile case and hand it to another. No, uh, there isn't, Michael. Unfortunately, it, uh, the founding agency, i.e., the Hawkins County Sheriff's Department, is the originating agency. So they 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 call the shots. Yeah. So 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 you would have to be invited in. Our, the Cold Case Foundation would have to be invited in by the agency and or the family. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, we're certainly hoping for justice. And, and uh, I really do appreciate you guys being here. And uh, it really does. It means a lot. And I think uh, Dr. Gary had to take a quick little break. But you had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> we're, push, we're pushing we're pushing three hours and uh, we're trying to keep it condensed uh, and it sounds like they're cutting my house apart i don't know what's going on behind me yeah buddy's getting into stuff again I, i'm telling you that's the that's the guy he's he's back there working so anyway um 
Well, I'll, I'll wait for Dr. Gary to get back before we uh, uh, sign off. But uh, Chris, thanks again for, for your time and Anytime, brother. You energy know. into this case. And, you know, whatever side of this you're on, and I know that they have core supporters and I'm not knocking, I'm not knocking that. Uh, but I mean, just listen, listen to what Chris and the doctor said. I mean, even, even if, even if they're not directly responsible, look at all the other, look at the other catastrophes, uh, it, that they've caused for people, for the children, children, their children are gone. All four of them. One is outstanding. They, they can't account for her. They don't know where she is. Five-year-olds do not vanish. They yes, don't sir. vanish. There, there's a reason. Something, there's a reason behind it. And those parents know more than they, and I'll just be frank, because you know I don't beat around the bush sometimes. Those parents know more than they're putting on the table. End of story. No doubt. And, and I've not left that house from day one. The moment I walked into it, the moment even today, if I were to go back in there, I'd start in the exact same spot. And there's there's a lot of information out there that has not been provided yet. And when it is provided, then a lot of the answers will, will, will come to the surface. Uh, but they're just not there just yet. The cop, the the PD may have those answers, but now they have to deal with the district attorney. You can have all the answers, and the DA may say, well, yeah, but we need one more thing. And that could turn into two more things, three more things. I mean, if, if you think about it, just look what just happened in the Koberger case. They knocked that house down. Okay. That... I'm going to, you know, I'm on the record of saying, and I've said it, that that's going to be a huge problem at some point. And, and, and so there, there's a lot of that stuff probably in this case, too, that we're not aware of. But the one thing the Cold Case Foundation stands ready, if, if anybody asks, then we would be ready to do it. And guys like, you know, Dr. Picado and, and many others, we assemble a team like the Mayo Clinic does, and the agency gets the opportunity to listen and learn, and we get the opportunity to listen and learn. But we work in conjunction with each other, and we help each other, uh, i.e., the goal here is a five-year-old little girl, Summer Wells. What happened to her? And we bring a lot of resources from around the world some of the highest profile people you can think of are, are involved in our organization. And if people aren't aware of it, it's all Zoom. And you have this massive wall of experts. Uh, we've had as many as, uh, I've been in meetings with as many as 23, 24 people in a single meeting. And everybody had an expert, everybody has an expertise in what they say and do in these conversations. And that's how you get results. And one of the things we always go back to is citizens solve crimes. Cops and investigators are the recipients of information that flowed into the investigation and then they made sense of it. But it was the citizen who picked up the phone and said, hey, I need to tell you something about A, B, C, and D. Right. And that's how it gets resolved. Look at that. I got another thumbs up. I didn't even do it. <laughs> and there's uh, Brandy Neal. And I, I was will say that I, I've heard the district attorney in that case say that he is, is going to uh, prosecute that case. Well, get to prosecute and partner. Let's do this. Okay. I mean, he's, he's came out on the record and say, I'm going to prosecute. Well, we've heard it a couple times from you. I think, uh, I think we're, we're with you and we we're hoping that that happens. Very, I, very I, lo I love Brandy, Trevor, grandpa, M Michael Vaughn's family. And they're, they, they know, 
they know. So this is this is uh, you know complete opposite too by you know out front there, and you you know I can't say anything about it, but you know so and I can't jeopardize anything, so I'm not going to. I totally understand. Well, uh, Doctor Gary, do you have anything to say on your way out? I, I really appreciate your time. I know that you had a packed day. Of course, and you're probably hungry. Uh, that is indeed true, but uh, but uh, that's okay. Uh, it's 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 it'll be there when I'm done. Uh, when I'm done here, so it's okay. I I, I have provisions uh, available to me. Um, I mean, what is there to say that hasn't been said? I I just think we have to, you know, when 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 we're sort of done, kind of tearing into this, like you know, like three pound dogs. <laughs> I think we have to kind of pause a minute and and sort of emphasize that what we're talking about here is. Um, a situation where you have parents who have not been formally charged, but it is entirely possible, although from the sound of everything we're saying, it would sound like we're saying improbable, but it is entirely possible that these are people who are suffering the loss of their child. Right. So that we always want to be sensitive to the possibility that we never know what's going to come out of a case. So, and, um, and I also think that we have to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, this is really about this poor kid. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, whatever happened to her, uh, you know, she didn't die in her bed. Whatever happened to her was ugly, terrible. She didn't die peacefully laying back on a pillow so that, you know, or, or go someplace that's pretty. The, the fact of the matter is, this is a horrifying story, whatever it is we find out. And the tragedy of it is, is that it just feels like this poor kid's, you know, blood is crying out for justice and i just hope that if there is somebody out there watching because sometimes i think people do watch these shows because they know a little more than they admit they watch these shows and they flirt with the idea of picking up a phone and ratting somebody out finally you know uh in fact i shouldn't say rat i think that that, that i should tell dropping the dime on somebody who deserves it would be more like it and and I think, you know, there is that. And then there are people watching who are in their own horrendous situations where they know about something ugly a person has done. And, it, you know, I just want to encourage them to to seriously think about, you know, justice and safety and the, the you know, putting oneself on the line for that instead of, you know, being scared. Because the truth of the matter is, if the supposition is true that the father in this case has anything to do with it or the mother has anything to do with it these are you know you talk about somebody who in theory targets kids you know has targeted a kid this is not a strong scary person this is a, a, a you know this would be a kind of a pathetic person you don't have to be that scared of right i mean you're talking about i mean think about the kind of person who would target like children and and, and females and you know this is a this is a person where you're going to get a lot of talk and a lot of threats and a lot of but you know, I, I think it's important for the people to say, OK, justice is more important here than being scared. Now, does that resonate with the two of you? Do you get what I'm trying to say here? And uh, and so I just want I, I know that somebody out there knows more because this is a sloppy thing. There has to be somebody who saw something suspicious. And I just I cannot think that this is going to go on forever. I really like Chris's idea about two people turning on each other. And as a matter of fact, if I were involved in this situation, that is exactly the psychology I would use. I would try to split them, to try to get them to, you know, because when, if it is possible that they are, that they have a secret with each other, one of the things you want to remember about couples like that is, is that part of the reason it's done together is it creates a safety pact because if you tell on me, I tell on you, right? So we've got to keep a secret together. Well, if that's what's going on here, divide them, <laughs> make make it every person for themselves. And you'll see that, you know, there's no honor among thieves. You know, people turn on each other. And I think, Chris, that's what you're suggesting is that these two, <laughs> these two one of them, they're like, you know, they turn on each other, you know. Well, it seems right? like they do in other circumstances and that they have, uh, you know, with the cop calling and the, uh, yeah, you know. That's exactly. And right. here's a great question here from How do you Amy. make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? What's that? How do you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Um, go ahead. Proceed with the with the joke. No, <laughs> it, it's right. I mean, 
you got to put jelly on one side and peanut butter on the other. Oh. And, then, and then when whoever bites it goes, ugh. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> right. But you know what I mean? It's it's sort of like it, with people like that, you know, someone's going to come out being the one who kind of went. You know, it's like in, in ancient Roman times, they had that, that for fun. You would take a prisoner and put them in a bag with a snake and a monkey and a cat or a dog and a cat and a snake. And you throw them in the water and everybody would take bets on who was going to get out of that bag alive. Right. <laughs> well, it's kind of like that. One of these the animals in this bag is going to be the winner, you know, and it's just that's what you have to count on is that if there is something going on here that is dark and nefarious, prey on that, push for it and let the fragmentation go. Either that or, you know, create such safety for the children that they come clean about what they may know, uh, because I think fear is a very powerful motivator uh, when you're living in a despotic situation with a, a kind of a if that's what's going on here where, you, where you're frightened of the caretaker or the leader or whatever or the boss in a certain kind of job who is awful people divide up into camps right there's the the camp where you play along right you can't beat them join them right so you're obsequious and you do whatever the boss or the the, the partner wants so that you're safe and then there's the second bucket which is the people who are completely paranoid that that you know don't say a word you know because they, they they don't believe they don't like what the leader is doing but they they go along with it just enough to not get hurt because they they're, they're, they're they don't they don't want to get injured and then the third is the depressed reaction where you basically say I'm hopeless no matter what I do I'm gonna get beaten up or abused here so what's the point right and so that uh, you look at those kinds of homes and you start thinking what bucket do people fall into and then you know what technique you need to kind of convince them you know to with the paranoid you make them feel safe with the the obsequious, you make them realize that they're just getting cheated and hurt. And with the depressed, you make them feel that there is some hope and you make meaning out of the experience. So it's all about understanding the dynamics and then going in and having an intelligent person with some experience have a chat with, with these people. And I, and I, you know, but it's also possible that there's going to be some other explanation, although uh, I am loath to believe it because it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I'd, I'd certainly be the first one to be fascinated to see it. You know, imagine one day we find out they actually arrest somebody in this case. I mean, who was the intruder? I mean, okay. But on that day, I'll sit down with the three of you. We could eat, you know, our hats and humble pie and crow all at the same Absolutely. time. But, but, but it would be, it would be weird. It would be weird. So, you know, but, I got, I got hammered a while ago. Yeah. Uh, just real fast on the Gabby Petito thing where I made a comment that I'm not sure the family's not involved in this. And the internet went nuts about me. And guess what? It ended up the family was involved. And uh, I mean, they took me down, right? They, they grabbed, you know, all the trolls and everybody just, they tried taking me down. Okay. I don't say things by accident personally out here in the public arena. I know you don't either, Dr. Gary and, and Josh. And this is why, you know, I think we're, this is a good synergy tonight. And to answer this question. So the reason I prep that is I'm going to, I want to answer this question for Amy. Okay. Uh, is do I think that DW being segregated for his own protection when he was in jail is relevant to summer? That is a great question. I, and I will answer it very carefully, Amy, that even there is a code of ethics sometimes among thieves. The one thing they don't like are individuals that prey on children in the system. The system resolves problems uh, quickly within the system. And the only thing that law enforcement has in the jail system is to put some people into protective custody, PC, and segregation for their own safety. So that is a possibility. Whether that's the case in this particular circumstance, 
I, I don't have the answer to that, but that is an, a, a possibility. Yeah, and thank you for that question, uh, Amy, one of our great mods. And, and thank you to the mods tonight. I know that it's been busy and, uh, you know, we always take care of our, our guests that are on panel. Uh, but, you know, if one of the, if not the best chat around, I'm telling you, you know, everybody is just so pleasant 99% of the time. And so, uh, like I said, I appreciate you guys being here and, um, I hope your first experience on the lab was okay. Uh, Dr. Gary, I was a little nervous. I was like, uh, I hope he, I, I hope we don't, uh, but I, Chris was the one acting up, but I, make I thought it was great. I, I really did. I love the integrity of oh, it. Oh, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. It's absolutely, uh, and, and also, um, because, from doing the interview room so frequently and also other things I do, I, I appear a lot on, you know, court TV, news nation. Uh, I've been on Dateline a couple of times on um, Nancy Grace. I do a lot of this stuff and people try to contact me and um, believe me, they will find a way, uh, you know, as I have learned. And so what I did was I, you know, I, I, I made it so that, you know, I, I now am on social media so people can find me on, twitter or instagram or something because this way they can contact me with their questions and so forth and i'm not getting you know snail mail uh at the office or, or phone calls at the office it's easier for people to just reach me there uh and um you know it may take me a while to get, it, to, get to it but i will so if people want to find me there they can uh and uh, but the people are very kind uh it's been a pretty troll free evening we haven't gotten too much abuse here in the uh <laughs> the, not the, yet. The, not, right but i've been pretty happy with that and people say very nice things i i see somebody here wrote me a message saying they want to know if they can give me a hug well <laughs> okay mentally here we go i'm sorry i'm sorry i wrote that <laughs> <laughs> well okay i mean i should, it's, it's I sweet. should ask you off the air <laughs> They do say sweet things, so it's very nice. And um, but yeah. and regarding the book, um, you know, I, I've been I'm very proud of the new evil. It was co-written um, by my mentor, um, Dr. Michael Stone, who passed away uh, in December. I miss him every day. He very much leaves a hole in the the heart of my life. To be honest, that he's not here uh, every day. That something happens in the news, I kind of turn to get his opinion. Uh, and um, it it I you know I'm proud to say that it was you know, the number one bestseller in uh, forensic psychology on Amazon uh, many times now. Uh, it's easy to find in um, Barnes and Noble or anywhere. I mean, it's a very popular book. It's used uh, as a textbook in a few forensic psychology programs at this point. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm very, very proud of it. Um, it's deeply disturbing. I do want to put that out there. Uh, you are not going to read that book and, you know, want to sit down to a meal or, or lay back and, you know, chill for the evening, but you will learn a lot. You will learn a lot. Uh, it, it is a, um, the culmination of many years of insight that Dr. Stone and I both have from the work we do and the, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people we've talked to who have either, um, been experiencing severe personality divorce, severe mental illness, criminal fantasies, uh, you know, actual criminal acts and the thousands of cases, historical cases, that we've examined um, across the annals of crime. And I think it will give you a lot of pause, a lot to think about, um, but it's very heavy stuff. Uh, and um, that is one of the things that when people do contact me, they point out is that they learned a great deal, but like they're not the same. <laughs> they're, very, they're, they're haunted by it. Uh, there are stories in, the, in that book that will never leave you. Uh, and I am working on another one. Uh, and um, so, I hope that that people will go out and buy and buy that book too. Absolutely. Um, but, um, and um, you know, so can I get you to answer this question? Tre Trev Trevor is a young man from East Tennessee. Uh, he he helped search for summer and donated to the reward fund, uh, and talks about a lot of missing people from East Tennessee. Uh, please put Trevor's uh, link to his uh, YouTube uh, in the chat. Uh, but his question is psych nerd here. Could, could Dr. Mercado explain how psychology plays into a potential court case in a case like this? And, um, I'll, I'll let you answer that. And then, uh, I'll, I'll sign us out. 
Well, this is a very complicated question because it isn't clear if what the individual means is to paint a picture of potential motive and malice and other things for a jury, or if they mean because there's a question of the truthfulness of people that are in trouble, uh, where you're looking for things like making up stories or exaggerating or so or contradictions, or if you mean um, people trying to claim, you know, that mental illness played some kind of role or pressures they were under. In other words, it, it's unclear. There are so many different ways that forensic psychology plays in. And the reason I, I think it's an important point um, that it plays in so many ways is it gets right to the heart of what people tend to misunderstand about what forensic psychology is because they think that, you know, we're all Clarice Starling, you know, running around looking for Buffalo Bill and talking to Hannibal Lecter in the basement in Baltimore in the prison. But that's not really what it is. Much of forensic psychology is sitting and doing testing or interviewing with a person and writing a report, you know, that that may never be used, speaking to the competency of a person to stand trial, um, uh, trying to figure out um, if a person is malingering, you know, uh, uh, making something up, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, in, you know, talking about if you can, if there are mitigating factors that might help in determining, you know, what kind of sentence somebody should get. That's a lot more what we do. And then some of us um, wind up being consulted by law enforcement or or other people who just want our thoughts on a case where we're, they say, make a sketch of what this person might be like. I'm very fortunate because, you know, uh, in imitation of, of my beloved Sherlock Holmes, I basically made up my own career. I didn't want to be stuck into a box. So I mean, it wouldn't stimulate me intellectually. So I do everything. I want it all. I'll eat the whole menu. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I dabble. And I am very fortunate because I came to the attention of some very wonderful and prominent people. I mean, all the way up the kind of chain in, in the forensic world. And then I got invited to do things like be on the Cold Case Foundation expert panel and things like that. So that cases come you know, I, I, I'm consulted on things. I'm asked about things. I get to opine on things. I get to come on shows like this and do that. But also behind the scenes, of course, I do forensic work, you know, and I'm, I'm asked about things. I go in, I talk to offenders, etc. But but it's important for people to understand what a forensic psychologist is. This is not CSI, you know, that what's that character's name who wears the glasses and sits at the computer and they ask her a question and she just punches some things in and then like, spews out all this data you know and then like they go and arrest the criminal this is a silly <laughs> depiction it Roz? Roz? i think it, i think that's it I like it's a very that. silly depiction right that that is not at all what we do and and i have to tell you i have seen many students say that they want to do this and then go to school for like a month and they're bored <laughs> it's not what they think it is right so there's some of that in that question of you know what could psychology do in the courtroom? Well, there's a lot of things we do, but what you're probably not going to see is somebody going in there and like profiling for the for the jury and the whole thing. As a matter of fact, there's, there isn't enough interest in motive, in my opinion, in the courtroom. Uh, that's the whole thing. We right. think it's important, fascinating, especially for predicting that somebody's going to offend again and things like that. But you'd be shocked how little people care about it. I w I'll, t I'll tell you this final story. I was on a news program. Chris, you know this. I was on a news program about Kohlberger, who, of course, innocent to proven guilty as always. But I was on a show, and there was a, an attorney talking. And I was talking about the potential motive of the offender. And the person was like, why are you talking about that? Motive is not important. Who cares about it? It's not essential. And then they kind of cut it off, and I didn't get to say what I w wanted to say. <laughs> what I wanted to say was it matters because if the motivation is is what I suspect it may be, this is a person that if the jury says, let's let him out, might do it again. A jury needs to know what's on the line <laughs> with the psychology of a person when you're contemplating letting them out, right? And so motive is very important for predicting future behavior. Because if your motive is personality or fantasy, you're not going to stop. That's right. the whole thing. And the reason that comes right around to this case is if what you're suggesting is 
that this child in the Wells case was hurt in the context of a perverse life in which someone has a certain quality where they might be interested inappropriately and sexually in, let's say, a child or children. People like that don't stop. That's the point. And therefore, tick-tock, it's only a matter of time until eventually everything is revealed because you don't have an isolated thing. If that's what's being hypothesized, you can imagine that either it has happened before and therefore someone knows something, or it would happen again, and it will come out then. But those kinds of people, they escape, they slip the net to just do it again. See, Chris, don't you think that's an important point? That's why we love you, Dr. Bricado. I, I think that's the whole point. That kind of person doesn't stop. Same thing happened. Uh, Chris and I are very interested in the, the Rachel Morin case. Mm, right? Yes. So you got that, that story in L.A., and you got that story in Baltimore, right? Well, think about it this way. Imagine escaping what you did in L.A. all the way across the country to Baltimore. And when you get there, instead of hiding out, you sexually assault and kill a woman. I mean, that's a stupid thing to do. But it tells you something about the compulsiveness of that kind of character. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. If you believe, if you are a viewer who believes that Wells was an inside situation, that there was abusiveness, there was sexual perversion, whatever, don't expect it to stop or don't think it never happened before. What you can expect is that stuff will keep repeating and therefore a matter of time. So so that that's why I, I have a little bit of hope about that. But, but I don't know what other people think about that, but that's my opinion is uh, that, and I think that if that's the situation, Perhaps law enforcement might give you enough rope to hang yourself. Sit back and sort of let you trip yourself up or something like that, right? Because like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> well, uh, I'm saying is sometimes, you know, we make the assumption that people don't know what they're doing, but you know, or that they're turning up that they're too busy. How do we get to the they, may, they may be, they may give someone enough rope to hang. You know what? Everybody just had another master class. From one of the brightest minds in the in the world, yeah, uh, and I and I, you know, and I don't say but that enough about you, Chris. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so funny. I love Gary. You know, he he. If you guys haven't noticed, he is just always spot on. And you know, Josh, I got to tell you that um, we love you too, buddy. I mean, you've been oh, yeah. you you're just a great great person. And um, my wife though is pulling on me yeah. in the. Uh, dining room right now to get to dinner so would you be okay if i excuse myself well, we're, we're, both, we're both gonna have to go back and do the same we're out of here i yeah, appreciate right. it you guys and lab rats thank you guys so much for putting up with us tonight we sure do appreciate you guys that's those are followers of of josh's channel they're he calls them lab rats i love that i mean how smart is that and that then and then the people in the chat are chat rats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Anyway, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Uh, Gary, I'll call you later. Uh, you. I've got to go to dinner right now, though. But thank all you. right. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much. Be Bye. Bye. All right, Josh. I'm, I'm also going to head out. So we, it was thank you very much for your time, and, Doctor. We'll uh, talk to yeah, you. Did you find it useful, helpful, interesting? Yeah. It was amazing. It was, you were, uh, you and Chris were spot on and uh, so respectful, even, re you know, respectful to towards everybody. And, and I really do appreciate that. So uh, well, we, thank we, we, we have to be remember, no matter how horrible the things are that people may have done, they are still human and still our brothers and sisters. That's true. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I, I always think about that. You know, I always have this funny image of, you know, for those that are religious in the audience, I always have this funny image of, meeting my maker, getting up there, being completely annoyed at half the people that are up there too. And God saying, would you shut up, sit down. Those are your brothers and sisters. <laughs> you have to eat with them. You know, because I, I think that, that we, we probably What's won't be too happy. What's up up here, God? <laughs> I think we may not be too happy about some of the people we have to share it with, but, that, but they are ultimately our, our brothers and sisters, as painful as that is, to, to acknowledge. It is probably true. All right. Well, thank you so care. much. Doctor. We'll talk to you soon. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye bye. And there you have it. A fantastic show. Uh, I want to thank everybody who showed up. Thank you guys. 
uh, for all the support and the love. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed anything. I'll go back over it. And uh, yeah, what a show. Wow. I told him an hour and an, I said an hour to an hour and a half. <laughs> and we're at three hours and 10 minutes. And um, I couldn't be more happy about it. I appreciate you guys so much. And like Dr. Gary says, innocent until proven guilty. I appreciate it. Ah, that was a lot. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>